Hello world, my name is Data Mining Mike, and on this episode of the podcast, we are going to talk about how to create a cybersecurity business. Today we have a special guest, Casey Davis. Casey is a professional penetration tester and expert social engineer. He is a white hat hacker who is paid by clients to break into their buildings and run cybersecurity attacks. This is an incredibly fascinating podcast. Not only is Casey loaded with amazing experience, I am highly confident you will be able to take what you have learned and apply it to your life in some benevolent way, and that's called value. And because of that, you should like this video. Remember that sharing is caring, and subscribing gives you more value and smashing the bell gives you sustained value. But first, look into the world of AI news. Did you know if you buy diapers, you have a higher probability of purchasing beer? And that's called market basket analysis. Market basket analysis is a data mining technique used to discover co-occurrences between items in transactional data sets, such as retail data, medical diagnoses, or prescription data. Traditional MBA algorithms have been effective for this purpose. In fact, they are more efficient than Llama 2 or ChatGPT. While transformer language models are good for predicting the next word in a sentence, they are not good at predicting what items are commonly purchased together like Amazon can. Market basket analysis, what's in your shopping cart? Casey, everybody. All right. Casey Davis. Uh, Tell the world about you. Uh, yeah, that's a story. So currently um, the cloud and application security manager for Travel Centers, who is a subsidiary of Bridge Petroleum. So that's uh, that's what I do. My, my long story is uh, I'm a red teamer, pen tester, uh, covert physical entry, network forensics, social engineering. And uh, that's all from a misspent youth uh, going places I wasn't supposed to be. That's cool. <laughs> Which makes this a good podcast. This is going to be, this is a good one, people. Because you were telling me before this about the uh, EQ and having a good ear just for that on the mixer here. So, yeah. But, yeah, I also tend to find that people lighten up, too, once the camera goes, once the 20 minutes is done. And then they're like, oh, there's no camera on me. So now I feel better to talk. Never had a, um, I suffer from unwarranted confidence. So oh. uh, like a lot of people have that, like fake it till they make it kind of thing. But like, that's ingrained in my, like, I'm oh, like, I just assume that anything I set out to do, I'm going to do well. That Like it never crosses my mind that I'm going to fail until I do. And then I get a little butt hurt that I do, but then it's just like, okay, like what did we do wrong? What, what are the lessons learned? Mm-hmm. Let's approach this again. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah. And we've been drinking, so you can't hold us liable people. I don't Cheers. know if you could call that drinking. We've literally had that much of one beer. So, but cheers. Cheers. Happy yes. Thursday, man. Happy. Good. Yep. That's what it's all about. Made it to Thursday. So you brought your pen testing equipment. I did. I did. And some of it. Yeah. So uh, uh, shameless endorsement of Hack 5. So um, Darren Kitchen and Shannon Morse, uh, the, the main figureheads of Hack 5, have done a wonderful job of taking all the things that I used to have to solder myself and, and turning them into convenient, easy to use tools. And so I bought them all. As soon as I could. It's been a lifelong dream. Um, so now that I get paid enough to buy stupid toys, I buy the stupid toys. Um, that That's like, that's how we got to where, you know, that's where we are now. How we got here started with, with elementary schools, lock picks, and too much extra time. So, you know, how, how, whatever, whatever you want to hear about in terms of, like I said, my, uh, my background in, in, in red teaming kind of focus in those areas, uh, getting physically into places you're not supposed to be, um, either by talking my way in, which is the usual way in, or if I have to parkouring my way in or picking locks or, uh, my, the, my last exploit, I managed to get through about four doors with a piece of cardboard. That's so cool. That, yeah. That was, that was a fun one. Uh, kind of scared the receptionist there. And then um, network forensics. So once I get in the building, what do I do? Um, my background legitimately is uh, IT support desk, which is where so many of us start. And then, uh, so which is where I got my soft skills. That's where I got my customer service, break teeth, teaching old ladies how to configure their outlook and stuff like that. Um, once I got into the the sysadmin side, then you start looking at the networks, then they start setting up networks. So I, uh, I always found a pleasure in subnetting and, and isolating networks. So I kind of gravitate, gravitated towards network forensics. And then, uh, then I realized real quickly that you can't do everything. You can't be an expert in everything. So I started branching out looking for people to do stuff like write low level code or solder circuit boards for me or whatever, so that we could actually go out and do something. So yeah, that's, uh, 
you know, early, early start to, uh, to, uh, you know, misspent youth to here. That's, uh, that's a quick rundown. You know what, real quick, are you able to like go through your, like your bag of pen tester stuff and hold it up in front of the camera? I can. Like, I mean, just to be like, Hey, it's this, this is this, and this is that. Yeah. I, mean, I, I guarantee. For you. Oh, sure. Yeah. If you, if you want to bring that black sleeve. Oh, I, I guarantee Darren kitchen will, will have a fit, especially if you tag hack five in it that, uh, that we're showing off their gear. Well, they love a backlink because that'll increase their domain. Totally. There you go. Let's SEO on it. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. So what's, what's that? <laughs> uh, well, they've, they've got a lot of them. So we can start with everybody's favorite. Um, All right. Just so the audience knows. Oh, I wonder what that was. I don't know. We'll find out soon. <laughs> it was the empty box. Anyway, a penetration tester is a person who is hired by companies to break into them and hack them. Yeah. You hey, let's go. Let's go. You are oh, a professional yeah. white hat hacker. No, this is great. So, like, because I listen to like a uh, uh, shameless plug, Sean Ryan and some of these other podcasters, and uh, like the same thing with all the special forces operators. You're like like they, the umpteenth person who's talked about Sean Ryan. That, guy's, that guy is a, so, this guy yet. so Joe Rogan is the master just because he's already there. Like Sean Ryan is the up and coming star. Like keep your eye out for him. Okay. You, one day, if I ever get successful, I'll be on his show. Kind of like Keith uh, Montgomery or some of these guys. Right. Yeah. Mm. So, um, yes, a, a penetration tester is somebody who gets paid and has permission to do what I've been doing for a long time without permission. Yes. Um, so again, Back to some of these uh, some of these great tools. So back in the day, we used to have what they called a vampire tap, and uh, it was literally a clamp you'd strap around a cable, usually a Type F, so uh, like a coax cable, right, mm-hmm. uh, for like your old cable boxes, and that would cut through the ground and connect to the main cable, and then also clamp the ground so you complete the circuit without causing an impedance error because you broke the shielding, and it would allow you to essentially wire shark that network. Okay. So we moved on to Ethernet, and then uh, when we got into the age of hubs, you know, you could Wireshark anything. Then after a while, we got into switches. Everything is its own broadcast domain. Fine. So now what do I have to do? I have to put a tap somewhere between the outline and uh, your your edge device, your your router usually. So what we use now is uh, either this Oh, guy. yeah, just show it in front of the camera. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, we have a, a, a packet squirrel, and uh, let me see. Let me make sure I get the right one. This is the packet squirrel. Sure. So the packet squirrel is something that you walk up and you're like, all right, I'm going to, somebody has an unsecured server room. I'm going to. Oh, even. This. Yeah. If, if I got in the room, I could, I could interrupt your service for a millisecond. Nice. I was wondering what those rub lights are for. Yeah. Uh, I could interrupt your service for a moment, uh, which is also why I carry around spare patch cables. I can pop your WAN line into this and then pop another cable into the output. And you guys are back going live, but this has netcat on it. Mm-hmm. And it's calling home already. So as soon as it's plugged in and live, and the difference between these two devices is one's passive, it'll use power over Ethernet. The other is active, meaning that I can plug in like a, a remote charging pack. And I like if I have a 30,000 amp hour, this thing will last a couple of weeks on your network. Okay, so, it, so it's got a self-containing battery pack. One of them does. The other, use, the other will use power over the line. Okay. Yep. So which one is better? It's the environment. It's always the environment you go in. Semper Fi, you know this. Yeah. Yeah, it's the right tool for the right awesome. job. So if, they, if they're running a place that has cameras or VoIP phones, there's a good chance that the line has power over Ethernet, and I can use the passive one. If there's not, I always carry a little battery pack with me anyway. It's a little credit card-sized one. It'll give me three days or so. I'll plug that in, jack that in, and for those three days, it'll actively give me Wireshark, Netcat, all that good stuff. When the battery dies... The connection is still passed through. I just don't have my fancy tools anymore. So their service isn't interrupted, which is the important part. But, you know, I got a limited time for my tools, depending on the size of the battery pack. The battery pack really determines, like, the server room. If it's a place that looks like it's not been dusted in a while and nobody's been in there, I could put a big battery block and then leave it for, it'll run for months. This thing runs, like, no power at all. And I'll just tuck it away. If it's a really nice environment and I'm assuming someone's going to see this thing, then, yeah, I'll just leave a little credit card power that'll give me a couple of days. That's usually all I need. Yep. That's cool. Yeah, I just need a quick place to pivot. Well, no, the cooler one, again, thank you, Hack5, the Shark Jack is their first self-powered. They had to go through a lot of licensing constraints to get a LiPo in this. But this is a self-contained Linux computer that uh, has 
multiple payloads and programming switches and it's self-powered it'll run an hour or so you charge it up on USB-C and you take it in turn it on drop it into the first uh you know ethernet plug you see in the wall or the first you know somebody's computer you can get to whatever you plug it into the outbound let it sit for a little while and it'll end map the network or it'll, i mean essentially it'll run any shell script you want i tend to end map the network so that's a great tool um the bash bunny the bash bunny is nice because it gives me multiple payloads it's a usb piece that i can plug in and if i'm in an environment that has windows and apple i can flip between the payload that i'm dropping and the payload can be not just a script or an auto run, but it also can be a human interface device. So I can make this look like a keyboard and do Windows key R, type in CMD, wait a millisecond, type an entire PowerShell script, run it, and go. And you, all you'll see is a black window open and close. And it'll look like and it came from your keyboard. So short of like UAC controls at Windows, I got gotcha. you. You won't think nothing of it. Nope. And the one that most people are familiar with is the rubber ducky okay. which is same kind of device it's a usb it's uh if you remember stuxnet it's meant to be is what they call a usb drive-by so i uh i get some of these i write a program on it i toss it into your parking lot and i wait for some sucker to pick it up and look and see that it says annual bonuses on an excel sheet and uh you know it doesn't matter i don't have any macros or anything in that excel sheet because when you plug this in again it looks like a keyboard and it's just gonna run some scripts in the background that you're never gonna see so That's like, badass. So, like, this was made popular, at least culturally, in, like, Mr. Robot and things like that. The Rubber Ducky. The Rubber Ducky. Yep. That's a great tool. A a USB drive-by. Cool terms. Yeah, yeah, right? Things I never even heard of. <laughs> thought of. Yep. That, oh, is, that cool. is a... That's a good one. Um, we have the Wi-Fi Pineapple, of course, as everybody should have. Okay. A Wi-Fi Pineapple. What does your Pineapple do? Um... Gives you standard scanning of access points and things like that. Gives you the ability to do a, a evil twin attack or a karma attack on a Wi-Fi system. So if you've connected to a common system like a Starbucks or something, I can I can make it look like I'm a Starbucks. And because your phone will, because you said connect anytime, and I look like Starbucks, your phone's going to treat me like Starbucks for your convenience. And in the meantime, I'm just proxying everything you send to me. And I'll try SSL proxying what I can. But like, if I want to be real suspicious, I'll SSL proxy everything. And you'll get a little warning on every web page you go that this site isn't secured or it has a self-signed cert even when you go to Google. And hopefully you won't notice. But they've done a really good job about like putting up that page and stopping you and making you go to more settings and let me go to this unsecure page. So good on Google and, and the other browsers for doing that. Um, so now instead, I'll just wait for you to hit a UDP or an unsecured uh, uh, URL and I'll look through the clear text that I can get and I'll glean anything I can because a lot of places will use a high level protocol to do authentication AAA, but then they'll start passing data in the clear or using other protocols when they're past that authentication part. So I may not hear everything. It's like a glass on the wall, but I'll catch enough words to put something together. That's cool. Yeah, it kind it's of fun. reminds me of Google Whisper. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's a, um, yeah, that's, that is an interesting way of looking at it. <laughs> yeah. You could probably employ Google whisper really well if you use the pineapple. Right. So, so if I was to, let's say there was a local Wi-Fi place I wanted to monitor with a pineapple, how would I go about employing the pineapple? Uh, the pineapple, you have to screw in all these antennas, put it in, you know, set it up, get it spinning. Nowadays we have, we have flippers. So nowadays, we'll just take our Flipper Zero and we'll plug in our handy dandy Wi Fi board. And that will allow us to do the same kind of thing at this level. So let's see here. Let's go into Wi Fi, scan access points, go. There you go. Have a look. So uh, for the camera, we can see. But right now it's scanning all of the Wi-Fi that's around you. And if we decided to go further, we have like a deauth attack. So we could pick a particular network and we could send a deauth, which would disconnect all of their devices. So a deauth is disconnect? Yeah, it's a it's a standard part of the protocol. I don't know, like, do you remember requests for comments? RFCs? Mm, I know I know RFCs. You know of them? Yeah? Yeah. I'm just thinking like DDoS versus deauth. So okay, so we we would use DDoS to DDoS mm, if we just okay. wanted to DDoS you. Okay. But the trick is, I don't want to DDoS you. 
I just want to kick you off momentarily so that you have to reconnect. And in that reconnect, you're going to send the pre-share key. I need the pre-share key. Okay. Or more importantly, I need the hash that represents the pre-share key. So when I find the network I want, I'm going to de-auth all the clients on it. And you're all at once going to try to connect back. And I'm going to be listening to those radio calls. And every one of you is going to send that hash. I'm going to collect that hash. I'm going to go offline. I'm going to go back to my latte. And I'm going to send Hashcat or Jack the Ripper or whatever, or John the Ripper, or any of these programs that I want that can break those keys. And I'm just going to let it work. And with pre-share keys on like a WPA2, you know, decent chance I'll catch it on a dictionary attack. If it doesn't, then I'll find another way because it'll take too long. And, and there's usually an easier way in the network, like knocking at somebody's door. Mm. Cool. Cool. So, so if I wanted to use a pineapple, I would have to go to the place. I would Just have to find it. a place to plug it in at. And have you don't it have to plug it in. Concealed? No. So the, the problem with it is like if I set this up in Starbucks, you're all going to be looking at me funny because, and I'll show you here in a second when we're it done. Looks, oh, it looks hella technical with like, many elements to the antenna. <laughs> so, And this isn't even all of it. There's, there's five antennas total. So like if you set this up, looks like a wi-fi router yeah yeah it is it's 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 everything it's a wi-fi router it's it's a wireless client just like your laptop um it's everything and it's meant to do that it's it's a wi-fi extender but that's the point is i can i can get you on any network in any radio band there you go if you sit this beast and plug it into your laptop at starbucks i guarantee you are going to draw attention <laughs> yeah so I guess you'd have to hide it up in the rafters. So when you see, and again, I'll go back to Mr. Robot, which is, by the way, the best I love that cultural one. use of actual hacking I've seen. So, and that actor got his start in the Pacific. Oh yeah. Yeah. Dude, that's a great series. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Spielberg. Yeah. 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 And Hanks. That's mm -hmm. great. Nice. I didn't know yeah, that. He got his start in the Pacific. He was now I'm gonna have to go back and watch. Yeah. I'm watching Band of Brothers again, yeah. but I'll, I'll go back and oh, go the through Pacific the Pacific again. It's just better. I like them. I, I've always been. A, I, I I met Winters and I've been a fan of of Band of Brothers. Oh, Band of Brothers, great. You're right, right. But so like I, I like I don't take it away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I like, uh, <laughs> and I'm a Marine, so I'm biased. Right. No. Sure. Yeah. 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 Iwo Jima. Totally. Yeah. Um. So no, this is something I would like if I was if I was breaking into a place, I would set up in the building adjacent, not there or not at a public place where like it's just too conspicuous mm. uh it's a great tool but no it's not something you just set up where you're sitting and use so funny enough there are smaller um little wireless tools that you could just plug in your laptop and it just looks like any other external wireless device uh, it has two antennas instead of five or seven but it still covers both 2.4 and 5 gig range and it covers that whole range of of wep and wpa2 and 3 and tkip and the whole bit so that one will let you do all the same stuff this will it's less conspicuous but sometimes this has a bunch of built-in tools the in the shell scripts that are just very convenient plus there's a community repository, so people are always building extra tools, so there's always that to lean on. Same thing, by the way, applies for the Shark Jack and uh, the Bash Bunny and basically all of the Hack5 tools. The, the payloads or the configurations are community-based. They're all in Git, and people build new payloads all the time. So there's, there's, like, that's another benefit of using some of these tools where you're not writing the payloads all the time. You're not soldering circuits. You're not like trying to find USBs and track which one you have malware on and which one you don't. Is this safe to plug in? You know, it's stuff that's like that. Point. You don't right? even think about. Yeah. Well, what else? What else? What other? Oh, you dear Lord. Uh, that you could show. So these get situational. So when I'm going to a place to break into it, my first approach is always social engineering. It's not, and not like today, social engineering is considered like phishing and stuff like that. In my day, social engineering was dressing up like the UPS guy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's more behavioral engineering and relying on social assumptions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you, if you show up to a place in a $1,500 suit with a nice briefcase, people will let you basically anywhere. And they ask very few questions. However, in some places, the suit guy gets questioned, but the guy in the high vis with the hard hat and the clipboard Don't doesn't get, get a question. second look. So it depends on your environment. So then you get into tools like, like these, the, uh, I got to remember what they're called, the key croc and the land turtle. So the land turtle is much like those intercept devices. Um, but in this case, 
I plug it into the back of your computer, and then I plug your Ethernet into this, and everything's hunky-dory as far as you can tell, but Linux box. And it's powered off the USB, so I now have Wireshark, Netcat, and everything else I want, and it's already calling home as soon as I plug it in. Same thing applies for this guy, only this is a USB. It's made to go between the keyboard and or the dongle, allows for, it's a, it's a keylogger at the hardware level, your OS will never see it. Doesn't matter your endpoint protection. So hidden right behind the big desks with and even when i and i have this. literally seen it people go in look around the wires behind the computer move this thing around and never think about it mm -hmm. yep yep that's the truth because they uh what else what other anything else? so I, those are the majority of the tools i have a a a, a digital radio uh card that is what I used to use to catch RFID and sub G, but the flipper accomplishes most of that now. So I tend to use the flipper for all of that. Okay. Um, plus it's easier to code on the flipper. So like dealing with uh, pass through rolling codes. So when you go to your garage door and you send the, the signal to open, it sends the main signal and it sends a salt, right? Mm -hmm. um, that salt is predictable. So the trick is, pulling a couple of algorithms to find those predictions and then create a brute forcer. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, again, it's a lot easier to do on the flipper now than it was to try to write that on your own circuit board, get it soldered, get, you know, that there, this used to be all be hands-on you used to have literally a whole area where you were building your own crap to do stuff. Like we used to intercept uh, garage door openers in, uh, uh, fake rocks. So we would, but we have to solder those circuits ourselves, you know, build the antennas, make the plaster, paint the rock and toss it in somebody's yard. Now, like I can just drive by, park outside and wait for you to use your fob, catch it, leave. And then if I know the make of your car, I can check on the basic algorithms that you guys use to salt your codes and I can brute force it. If I'm really smart, I'll intercept the call and I'll catch the salt you are and I'll pass that on and then I'll increment plus one later. So that way... I can always be close to where you were. Cool. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So that is a lot of really cool stuff. <laughs> Cybersecurity is neat. A lot of people get into it because it's very sexy in Hollywood. Um, there are some sexy parts of it. Again, I, I tend to find the the person to person social engineering and covert physical entry tend to be the most mission impossible slash sneakers slash, you know, the most Hollywood parts of it. Mm -hmm. But the problem is like, that's the first step that gets you in the building. Now what? Mm -hmm. So like my job is to drop that wire shark uh, or that shark Jack long enough that my network guy in the van outside gets the call home, can get in, make a lateral movement, pivot so that we can actually get persistence in the network, regardless of the device I just dropped because in 10 minutes, I'm gonna have to put that back in my pocket and walk out like nothing happened. So he has whatever window of time that I have in that building to, f to hack the rest of the systems, pivot and get persistence go. So that like, it's, it's a little bit different than Hollywood, but I mean, they do a decent job of, of kind of showing you the, the general kill chain of how you, uh, and it is very, I mean, there's a reason we use red and blue team. Like it is very much based on uh, op four and, and actual field exercise kind of stuff. So the, the one thing I have liked about cybersecurity recently is it's very much in line with the military's thinking in terms of uh, chain of command, chain of custody, hierarchy, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I mean, shit, they, that's one good thing about the military is they need to be the forerunners. Yes. That shit. Yeah. Cause you're fighting the Chinese every day. The, and it's, I think it was Patton. I may be, I may be, this may be apocryphal, but I think it was Patton that said that uh, only in warfare does the student not have the luxury of learning failure firsthand. Mm, yep. I've heard that. Okay. Yeah. I may be, I may be no, misapplying. I may be misapplying I've, the quote, but you get the idea. It's, yeah. It's crossed my face. Yeah. Yeah. At least a couple times in my life. And, and I find that's true. And I find inside, like I've, I've paraphrased that and said essentially the same thing in cyber warfare, the student doesn't have the luxury of learning from failure. Oh, uh, excellent! Uh, tell tell everybody a cool cyber or tell everybody a cool penetration test story. While I grab some sure. Well, it's, I got to say my last one was really fun. Um, so, I I went to the the building. It's multiple buildings. Um, I went to the main building, and I yeah, everything's badge in. 
Except for the main door to the receptionist. So where is this building? I, I actually don't. Yeah. So like that, Yeah. I'll tell you as much of this as I can. Okay. Um, so I get to the building and I'm walking around and on the back side of the building, there's a rolly bin like you have at the grocery stores where they put all the broken down cardboard. Mm-hmm. And imagine this in it is broken down cardboard. So I grab a long piece of cardboard because I've seen that almost all of the exterior doors are glass. They have that half inch gap in between and there's a remote exit sensor at the top of each one. So a Rex sensor is used in places where they have badge in doors as a quick way for you to get out without having to badge out. Mm-hmm. And there's two types. Uh, a passive one just looks for movement and an active one looks for movement and either radar, infrared, or otherwise to try to like validate that you're a person and not a raccoon. So on the passive ones, you can get through with a puff of vape smoke is my favorite. Okay. Um, if you if you happen to be a vapor, uh, taking a, a nice big puff, get right at the edge of the window and blow through that little gap. And as soon as it moves in front of the sensor, the door will unlock. No shit. No shit. Freaking cool life hacks. Uh, <laughs> you can do it with a sip of beer. Take a sip of beer, get right up to the front, spit through. It's gross, but you could spit through that little gap in front of the sensor and uh, that'll you'll hear the click. It'll unlock the door. Um, in my case, I was pretty sure that they were active on the building, so they were infrared, so they needed heat. So I took this long piece of cardboard, and I tucked one piece under my armpit, and I just walked around the building and walked again, knowing that I'd be nice and warm now. And I walked up to that back door, and it's just one piece of cardboard. I slid it right through that gap up to the top and wiggled it, and sure enough, click. So I opened the door. The other door, because they had a man trap, but only one had mag locks and the remote set. So I walked through the other door, and I get to the interior door, and the interior door is a similar glass door with a mag lock and a badge in, but there's no way to get to the lever that actually holds the door shut, and there's no gap that I can see readily. So I'm like, well, I'm stuck. Like, I haven't really gotten anywhere. I'm here. I'm in the building, but I can't really go anywhere. So I take the cardboard, and I reach on the top of the the door, and there's a gap up top to, I guess, facilitate the arm. That's the auto-closer arm. So the cardboard slips through, and I wiggle it, and click, door opens. So I walk through that door. Now I get to the next door, and it's a badge in door, and I'm looking at it, and the jam is here, and you can see the lever that's actuated by the badge. So, as I am usually want to do, I pull out, we call it a traveler's hook. You guys would call it a 90 degree cleaning hook if you're at the uh, hardware store and are interested in finding one for yourself. I slip that over the back part of the latch, put a little pressure on the door, click, door opens right up. So now I'm behind the receptionist's desk of the only door that was open. And I kind of come up behind her and I'm like, hi. She goes, oh my God, where did you come from? And I was like, back there. And, uh, <laughs> She goes, how did you get in there? And I went, oh, with this. And I hold up the piece of cardboard. And the cardboard's probably six inches by 11 inches. And she goes, bullshit, show me. And I'm like, okay. In 15 years of doing this, I've never had somebody be like, oh, bullshit, show me how you did this. So I'm like, happily. So I take her outside and we walk all the way back through the process to get her back to her desk. And she sits down and I can see in her face the moment she realizes like, oh, I'm not as safe as I thought I was. And then I felt horrible. Because I was like, oh, I didn't mean to, like, try, like, nobody's going to do what I just did. Yeah, who'd have thought of that? Right, shit, like, right? like, don't, like, no, the, the person you're afraid of, the mass shooter, the blah, 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 they're not going to do what I just did. No. Like, don't worry about that. Like, that's corporate espionage level stuff. That's not scary person mad at somebody. Mm-hmm. So, like, I felt really bad about that. Um, so, we, we get through that. I go into the other building, and I'm heading up to my actual office. I don't have a badge yet. I get to the door. It's the same scenario. Badge in can see the actuator. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I just hook my way in, click, walk in, sit down at my desk, throw my lock picks down. I have an entire set of lock picks. It's like a 56 pick set. All I ever use is that damn 90 degree cleaning pick. I'm never picking locks, dude. I'm slipping latches. I'm always slipping latches. I'm never, never am I like sitting there with my torsion wrench and my pick actually picking a lock. Like I can do it, but I never have to do that. It's always dumber than that. It's always a piece of cardboard. That's kind of my new philosophy. Like, yeah, I carry my lock picks, but I never need it because it's always a piece of cardboard. That's a good <laughs> philosophy. 
That's like that <laughs> relates to life in a lot of ways too. Dude, it really is the simplest approach a lot of times. And uh so it's it's that same kind of thing. Like my my instinct is like walk in and lie my way as far as I can. And then I'll start relying on technical prowess to get me further. But I'm amazed how many times I can talk my way into the server room as like the Comcast rep. Like, hey man, your internet connection is down. People are complaining of speeds. Corporate just called us. Like, I'm from Comcast. I'll hand him a phone number to call. It's an 800 number. It's BS. It routes to my buddy Rob, who's in the van. Like, yeah, we got a tech there. Yeah, here's your order number that he made up on the spot. <laughs> yeah, it'll look as legit as you want. You need an email from us? No problem. So, yeah, it's like it's it's usually easier to magician your way in than anything else. Like when you when you get to high security facilities, then it becomes a different story. But even then, it's surprisingly easy to get in. And it's usually it's not what people think. The easiest way to get in is to look as conspicuous as possible. And I'll, I'll liken this to a cultural reference. There's a wonderful show called Burn Notice. And in one of the first few episodes, he makes a very subtle note that people should pay attention to. If you're ever in, like, he breaks into a house, and the first thing he does is he goes to the fridge and he grabs a yogurt. And now you're just walking around eating a yogurt. And if somebody comes in, this is uh, Hanlon's razor. Easier to, to apply to ignorance than to malice. So if I just look like I'm a yuckle that's in the wrong place, you're just going to be like, dude, get out of here. If I look suspicious with lockpicks in my hand, you're calling the cops. Better to be there with yogurt. Yep. Who wants to deal with cops? Better to just be like, oh, this guy's an idiot and move on your way. Totally. Yep. I love this. You're a legit fucking pen tester, man. This is fucking awesome. I mean, I I fell into it. I'm, I'm a born salesman and uh, I, I'm autistic enough that I categorize these things into patterns. Yeah, good. So Good. No, that, it, you notice these patterns. Um, and the thing is... Um, Crap, I, I, so much is going through my head right now. I'm thinking, man, lock picking. And, and I, I remember these cyber, these pen testing conventions. Have you been to those? So, no, sadly, I've only been to a couple of DEF CONs. Um, and that's mainly, yeah. I, I come from a less privileged class. Hmm. So I, I didn't have the money to get to Vegas. I didn't have the money to get in. I didn't have the time to be able to do that. Like, I had kids young. I had to grind. Uh, no, couldn't do that. But... I also, I come from that weird trans. So my first modem was a 9,600 baud. I come from that weird transition of, I grew up without computers. We played outside mm -hmm. up until I was like 10 or 11. Mm -hmm. And then we got computers. And I, I got very lucky in the sense that my grandfather who worked at a, a power station, think like a PG and E, but for uh, Washington state. Mm -hmm. And he got my mom a computer and taught me GW Basic, uh, uh, one of the many variants of Basic, when I was like ten, and never touched it past that really. But like he taught me Basic programming, and then when I was eleven, the movie Hackers came out, and that like so this circles back to that Special Forces thing I was saying earlier. Every Special Forces operator you'll talk to will attribute Rambo as being the reason that they are SF operators. Hackers is the reason that almost every pen tester in my generation is a hacker. Like, that movie epitomized a generation of cybersecurity practitioners. Now it's Mr. Robot. Totally. That's a great say. Yes. And and better done. Mm. Um, Sam Eshmel, I want to say, is the producer. Uh, his technical contacts, his, his the, the people that did his uh, technical supervising on that show, spot on. Several times I watched them go through an attack and go, that was real close to what I actually would have done. Like, real close. Oh, and so, like, they have that whole thing where they're, like, they're attacking, you know, Steel Mountain or whatever in the show. And then it turns out that, like, a place I work with works with Iron Mountain. And I'm like, wait, that's a real place? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, wait, that's, like, no way. So <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> talked about Iron Mountain in the podcast <laughs> as the owners of ChatGPT server farms. So. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ima imagine that they would quantify all that data. What? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> Yeah, hey, we need a training set. Okay, let's set up a data center specifically facilitated to hold everybody's data, and then let's use that as our training set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's what we should be doing And you wonder why of. I don't trust authority. <laughs> well, you know, and, and I think that's what we should be doing more of. There is this guy. In a way, yeah. yeah there's this guy, uh, Chris Jordan. He's a commissioner here in Spokane. 
And Dude, you're really, and I, I apparently this is supposed to be about me, and I have a pretty big ego, but let's flip this around. You're pretty well plugged into the local area here. Thank you. Yeah, it's, I, I just get around. I mean, when I put it all on myself, I'm like, hey, nobody's going to market me. Right. I got to market myself. And then I realize I got to go and go to different groups, go network. Well, that's, people. yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, uh, so yeah, for the listeners, uh, he and I met at a local business development meeting. Uh, which I just happenstance because the office that I rent, um, the lady that has all these spaces kind of facilitated that. And so we we kind of met through that. But Anne, uh, Anne Long, so shout out to Anne Long of yeah. Burpity here in Spokane, yeah. who yeah. runs our co-working spaces. Um, she has done a lot to facilitate the professional networking in the area. So Bill Clavis, who if you have not interviewed and if you can get the time, you should. Um he is a, uh, he started Second Watch here in, uh, it was in Liberty Lake. I think they're just in Spokane now, if they're still there. I've seen them hiring. Oh, they're still around. Okay. So they were like, before the cloud was the cloud, they were offering AWS services and kind of that onboarding MSP to get people into cloud stuff. Like literally before people had ever heard that Amazon had a, a web offering and, uh, didn't hear from him for like a decade. And then Anne was just like, hey, you need to meet, meet this guy, Bill Calavis. And I'm like, I kept fixating on that last name. It's, it's Hebrew. It's uh, like, I, I'm, I'm very, fr- like, I have a thing with names. So we met in person again. And I saw him and I was like, Bill, I know you. And I was like, dude, you and I worked back at like Gravity Jack, a software company here that's local. I was like, I worked with them and we worked with you guys. You guys got us into cloud. Like, I remember you. I didn't realize he was a cybersecurity guy, but he organizes like the the Spokane Cybersecurity Summit and some of these other things um, that does that community building. And then outside of that, we get uh, some of these other players in other business development and community groups. Um, I, just, I just find it very cool that you're plugged into that because I'm, I'm fairly good at networking, but I'm just now getting into the local side of it. I learned in the Marines. I went to, like I said, I had five MOSs. Uh, so I started off as an infantryman and from infantry... Basically, on my third enlistment, I had all the checks in the box hit, and they're like, hey. Did you just, like, re-up three times? Is mm-hmm. that Okay. Yeah, it was right before. Just Semper Fi, do or die. You. Hoorah, yeah. hoorah. Thank you. Yeah, it was uh, right before Afghanistan, and we had this very serious shortage. Well, we're just, it sucked. I mean, we, they needed as much help as they could. Yeah. And so they're like, hey, we are sending people to this human intelligence school human so you're no no, no i'm well aware of human that's yeah, yeah, yeah human school and you're gonna be trained were you like s4 it's s2 s2 sorry 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 s4 supply right i'm sorry yeah s4 yeah. intelligence my bad yeah, no worries sorry i'm not i've never served yeah no, worries. <laughs> no i'm glad you even know that um, uh but let's see here so i went to this school in damn neck virginia and i was trained nice. by all these counterintelligence guys no over in virginia you got farm boys over there teaching you too well i mean at this specific school in in uh by farm boys i'm sorry for the listeners farm boys are are langley trained cia operatives mm. not literal Most likely, rednecks. i mean these dudes i can't say too much but mm-hmm. I, mean, I, I mean i'll say whatever i want it doesn't matter it's not like they can hey man anything. i know a lot of trade craft i will talk about but at the end of the day it's like well it was an inter- they were like you're not interrogators no you're, you're tactical debrief yeah your behavioral analysis and they taught, it was the sexiest school I ever went to. And they taught me so much about the exploitation of information from witting and unwitting human beings. And that paid massive dividends in Afghanistan. Massive dividends. Okay. So good. We're, we're talking at the same level. So yeah. when I said earlier that I, that I take those patterns and I, I turn them into like, like algorithms, like mm-hmm. behavioral patterns that I use, uh, that I, I, yes, what you guys learned in human, that's exactly what I'm talking about where mm-hmm. like. Some people you can bribe, some people you have to threaten, some people like there, there's different motivators for different people. And there's different ways of looking at intelligence from the different people, depending on the circumstance that you're getting the intelligence. And as they don't teach that stuff in cybersecurity, but it is a huge part of cybersecurity and the, the naturals, the, the, I, I put myself in that same area where we, we're, when I say social engineering and I, I, I don't mean spear phishing and, and using set and things like that. What I'm talking about is this part of it. It's the human mm-hmm. intelligence part. It's it's what what we used to call a PI, mm-hmm. like follow them for a few days, see what they do, like see if they break their pattern for any reason, go through their garbage, literally. Like it's yeah yeah human. It's underappreciated and hard to define sometimes. And really, is a dying art. Because, it is. You know, dude, social media, tasks. Zoom, crap like that has destroyed mm-hmm. the ability to do this. Yep. 
Yep. Everybody's got that social shield. They don't want to talk to each other. They get uncomfortable. They get uncomfortable. And that's the thing. Like, some of the best conversations I've ever had have been uncomfortable. Case in point, I had a talk with uh, my boss's boss, and we spent a whole lot, like, more money than I care to concern on building some stuff. And we talked about, you know, how would you do it? And the conversation was heated, let's say. But when we, but like, we both mutually respect each other. Like, we may butt heads, but walking out of it, what was cool is, like, yeah, she and I may not get along, and, and we'll totally, like, like no, it should be like this. No, 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 it needs to be like this because of that. Like, oh, you didn't consider this. Mm-hmm. Like, we have that, but we have enough respect for each other on what we know and what's going on that we can have that conversation. So it's kind of neat because other people are like, oh, my God, what is happening over here? But meanwhile, we're like, we're just having a spirited conversation. So, that, like, I can appreciate that. It, like you're saying, it's a dying art. People, like, rhetoric is a thing. Yeah, no, they wouldn't. The people don't want to have a conversation. They want to go to HR. And we live in a society where mediocrity and conflict avoidance, it's a standard. It's rewarded. Yeah. Yeah, and there's something to be said about incentive-driven behavior. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but um, social engineering. Keep talking about that, because the more you talk, the more I learn. <laughs> And I was obsessed with this. Like, uh, like I would listen to a bunch of uh, social engineering podcasts. I've read the book, um, The Art of Deception. Mitnick's book. Very good. Yeah. Rest in peace. Cheers, man. Yeah. Shit. So, like, that to, to one of my earlier statements, uh, I grew up in the era of Memdex and some of these other guys. So, like, um, Eric Corley, uh, you guys would know him as Emmanuel Goldstein, uh, the mm-hmm. publisher of 2600. Mm-hmm. Like, I grew up with him and Fiber Optic and Memdex. Uh, shit. When I first started hacking, the first IP scanning tool I ever used was called Strobe. Do you know who wrote Strobe? Mm-mm. Julian Assange. As a mathematician in uh, Australia. Who'd have known that? I didn't know Julian Assange would, could even code. Yeah. I didn't even know that. Code. He wrote. He created the algorithm for Firehose and then implemented it. It's brilliant. Cool. Yeah, if you're into math. Yeah, you're a data scientist. If you're into math, go find Julian Assange's original papers on Firehose. It's his protocol. Okay. It's it, Wikipedia is the functional implementation of Firehose. No shit. Yeah. If you ever see the movie where the... I forget what movie it is. It, it, it has some actor playing... I think it's Cumberbatch. Jesus. I think Cumberbatch plays Julian Assange in this movie. Um but there, there's a, a point where he's describing how the system works. And one person is giving real information. He's describing it to Schmidt, who's the real German hacker that Assange worked with. Um, as one person sends information in, much like I believe the references to Weird Al Yankovic's movie uh, UHF, you get to drink from the fire hose. The idea is I submit information. And at the same time, the system generates a bunch of very legit but random information, shuffles it all together, and then pushes it forward. So now no one knows where that data actually came from. So if Manly hadn't uh, hadn't used the channels they did and it actually used um, WikiLeaks the way it's supposed to be used, it would have never gotten out that they were the ones who released that information. Because they were been overwhelmed with data. With anonymous data. Yep. Oh, yeah. Dude's a mathematician and a hardcore programmer. And, like, he's a lot of things. And he's not... Like, I'm not going to get into any politics or otherwise other than the initial mission that he started on, I full-heartedly believe in. Yeah, open source, open information. That's Transparency kinda, of government. It's kind of what now, I don't, the like, First I, Amendment's about. So here, and so we'll get a little, a little political. Like, I don't agree with the way that Julian Assange carried out what he was doing, even though I agree that that information should have been shared. On the flip side, I wholly agree with what Snowden did and how he did it. Mm, okay. So he didn't give the information out directly like Julian did. He understood the ramifications of what Julian did. Julian put out information that had operatives' names in it. Now you have, like, translators in Yemen who, whose lives are in danger because you published it you really shouldn't have. Whereas Snowden gave it to journalists who had an ethical responsibility as journalists to make sure they didn't publish stuff like that while still being able to get the story out. Did you hear the story... I didn't learn it until I did the... Uh, well, did, did you know about how Snowden got the info? Yeah. I learned... Rubik's Cube? Oh, yeah. Well, this this is what I was taught when I did this SharePoint class. And um, this... That Snowden was... When 
SharePoint was first implemented in the government because that's what the way they do. They're yeah, in Milnet. Push this new thing quick, uh-huh. hard, and fast. And nobody understood the concept of administrator permissions. Hey, to be fair, we had a mandate that we were going to connect all these intelligence agencies together. And we had, a, we had to solve that. So, like, with that in mind, yes. Yeah, and Edward Snowden had top level, level site administrator permissions and on SharePoint. And the government's like, all this classified shit, just put it on SharePoint. And he's like, well, I have it. And what's crazy is I had, when I first learned about that, because I, I had to take the SharePoint class, and then I'm like, oh, cool. So I went to the guy, the civilian, who was in charge of giving out permissions. I'm like, hey, can I have top level administrator permissions for the school of infantry and he's like yeah sure just like that yeah. and he gave it to me and i'm like what oh, what's wow. identity and access management oh, again wow. let's not be evil and that was the thing it, but yeah you're right social engine just walking up to somebody and just saying you don't know what you got give it to me so and i've i've uh again geez wow mr robot mm-hmm. did this perfectly so there's and I, i've explained this to people and it's funny to watch that they don't understand how this would work but I have been caught in places I don't belong mm. where I've first been guy with yogurt. Mm-hmm. Then I've been, Hey, I, I belong here and I'm trying to do something and you just need to let me do my thing to, I will have your job and you will never work again in your life. Do you know who I am? And I've done that in 30 seconds. Now, most people would say, well, that wouldn't work. How would you go from duh to you do what I say or you're done in this world? Why would anybody buy that? But it, it's, that's the part. So when I said I've broken down those patterns, that's the part no one wants to talk about. Conflict avoidance. Right. Or create <laughs> creating the conflict to get them to avoid. Mm-hmm. That's the part yeah. no one wants to talk about. And I so it's funny that you bring this up because I literally had to describe this in no uncertain terms to a, a fellow uh, today at work where... I said, the only way we're going to change what's happening is, and I, ha- I like, I have no pleasant way of putting this, but identify the patterns that are happening. Let them start what they're doing and then metaphorically slap them in the face. And in the moment of shock that you have hit them, implant the new idea. I was like, we call this in psychology trauma-based mind control. It's a horrible name for what I'm doing, but it is exactly what I'm doing. That's cool. But, you know, like we learned, like psychologists learned it from shock testing of airframes. Like hit an airframe at a, at, with a certain object, create a harmonic airframe falls apart. How do we avoid this? So my job is, no, no, no. How, how do I cause this in harmonic? How do I create the disruption? Because, and Every person is guilty of this with the exception of Zen Buddhist monks who are actively practice, practicing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, anytime we're having a conversation, you have some predisposed biases. That metaphoric slap in the face, which, by the way, if I could get away with it, some people just need slapped in the face. If you've ever seen an airplane. Some kids just never got No, no, spanked. not just kids. <laughs> like the, the best example is an Airplane, the movie. The lady gets hysteric and they do a whole bit where people stand in line and come up in front of her and be like, they slap her and they're like, it's going to be okay. That used to be how they dealt with hysterics. But listen, like pay attention to what's happening. You're hysteric. Your mind is in kernel panic. Literally. We slap you physically and it interrupts the process much like an IRQ call. We've broken the process that was breaking your brain. And now we can say, stop, calm. It's okay. We've implanted new instructions. Those new instructions would not take if you were still in kernel panic. That's the literal metaphor for what I'm metaphorically or, or you know, uh, what, what I'm doing. You know, again, I'm not actually hitting people, but you have to. And there's different ways to do it. You can. And this is where it's like you can be nice to people. This is they call it disarming. How do you disarm a person? Some people are disarmed by charm. Some people are disarmed by contrary superior logic. Some people are disarmed by nonsense. So we could just be having a conversation and, and we're having a great dialogue and then I could be like, yellow monkey paw. And your brain is like, you've now seen this thing and your brain is like, WTF. But now I can implant because whatever biases you had about the conversation we were talking about are gone because you're thinking of a yellow monkey paw. Same thing. We have like subtle, same thing. Okay, that's good to remember. Three things that break somebody's, that lower someone's defenses and there's lots of ways to disarm people but yeah that's like that when i say i break it down into a pattern or an algorithm that's that's actually what i'm getting at is like 
oh, they're in kernel panic. We can disrupt the process, implant new instructions. Now, if you want to get into like literal psychology, all of this was accounted for by B.F. Skinner in the actual realm of psychology. If you're if you're into that, go read that stuff. Have fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess B.F. Skinner was like yeah, the like U.S.'s version of Pavlov. And yeah. Conditioning and yeah, yeah, you took human. You totally yeah. know what I'm talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, yeah Skinner no, did almost all his good. work for the army, didn't he? Well, they a lot of it for whatever. The yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. No, it makes what I'm saying is it makes sense that your material would cover that because he did a lot of work for the army. Uh, well, that and Pavlov. So. Well, no. So that's what I said is that that it's Skinner was U, the U.S. contemporary to Pavlov. Yeah. 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 That's what I'm agreeing with. Totally. It's totally. totally. It's uh, it all relates. I'm just trying to like compartmental it in my mind to the three points you just said. So people like for the audience, people like to be flattered. People like to be. Confronted. Confronted. Challenged. Challenged. Not Challenged confronted. Challenged. There you go. And they'll accept that. Yep. If you can beat them on to in Superior logic. Level. There you go. And and what was the... Otherwise is that, like, again, a horrible phrase, but it, it's, uh, let's call it an interrupt process. Interrupted. So... Yeah. So... I have to I have to interrupt your your prior biases because... So here's the thing. You ever hear people that are like, oh, I'm, her- I'm terrible at remembering people's names. Yeah. You want to know why? It's because you're not paying attention when they introduce themselves. That's true. You're thinking about what you're going to say. That's so well, guess what? It's not about you. It's true. So be in the present. Don't be thinking about whatever you're thinking about that you need to say. Just listen. And you'll remember their name every time, Mike. I know, Casey. So I actually had to be taught that. I didn't realize it myself. I was taught that in like 2005. Good. And it clicked really quick. And Joe was the guy who taught me, and I'll never forget his name. Um, so, <laughs> but it was it was that same kind of thing of like, what happens is no matter what conversation you're having, people have things they want to say to you, and in front of that is that cognitive bias that most people are aware of now, at least surface wise. But so once you get through the bias, you still have this like they've got a cue. It's like a, a message cue they've got stored up, and it's it's a it's a um, it's not full duplex. It's a half duplex conversation. So they're not listening to you because they're just waiting to say what they have to say. Uh, so you have to interrupt that process. And absurdity is the easiest one to use as an example, but there are lots of subtle social manipulative ways oh God, that you can use to do that. And so like you're, like you're saying, you know, some people like to be flattered. Some people like to be challenged. There are lots of those angles to be used. There's probably a finite pattern. There's probably about nine of them. And... You have to find, not just find them, but uh, innovate, adapt, and overcome. If you try an approach and it doesn't work, try the next approach. And that's where that goes back to that earlier story of where I'd go from confused to I belong here to you don't belong here. Okay, that's the same thing. Like, I tried one, it didn't work. I tried the next, it didn't work. I tried the next, it worked. Brute force hacking, socially. And what's funny is people don't realize it's happening in the moment. They don't, they don't remember that they came in and you were confused, but by the time they left, they thought you were the executive and you belonged there. They don't remember it. I, I, I don't have a description for why, but it was every time. Dramatic. And that could be, that could be part of that trauma, ba- that interruptive process. And I can segue on that. Please. So what you did, what you're talking about is going, is what is called the Cooper's color code. Now Cooper's color code is. Now where... I get to learn stuff. Yeah, Cooper's color code is when you go from, like, if so, ha, somebody's awareness, right? So if somebody goes in and they see you in the getting yogurt, the first thing they're going to go is they're going to go from, it goes white, orange, white, yellow, orange, red. Oh, this is almost their threat level. Yeah. Okay. And so, so this almost goes back to that disarming they're, part. They're at orange. And they want a reason not to go to or, or to red. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. They don't want give to them a red. reason to go to white. I get you. Now, what you did when you threaten them is you go, you take, you took them. From, I flipped the table. You took them from white to yellow to white to black. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, to the yeah again, flip and the table, you go full from opposite white side to black. You put people into shock. Right, that's inducing that uncomfortable situation. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That's good. Yeah. And as scientists, in but so here's what nature, this is the part yeah. of social engineering I never hear talked about. All I ever hear about is like, you know, building phishing campaigns and making mock websites and that like all of it is that way or like SMS smishing and stuff like that. And it's like, no, no, no. All social engineering is me to you. And like every engagement is the next person. I hack each person as gates to get where I'm going. But nobody and maybe it's because it's difficult 
to quantify what this is. Like I put arbitrary labels on, or I correlate, again, trauma-based mind control is Skinner. So I correlate to what I know and yeah. say, oh, it's this. Taking them from white to black is dramatic. Like right. if you're driving totally. complacently and you see like, oh my God, a Tesla on fire. Well, and but like, you bring oh, up an not. interesting point. The fact that you're driving has you at yellow as baseline. You're already aware. You hope you're yellow at baseline. You better be. Unless you're on your phone, then you're definitely clear. You're beyond white. You're clear. Right, right, right. <laughs> the, to, to best intentions. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, that's... Uh, that's the part of social engineering I always find lacking. I have lots of books on like practical, ethical social engineering and stuff like that. And they touch on these subjects, but they never try to flesh them out. Mm. You know, they'll tell you like, hey, you can create a sense of urgency or you can create, you know, these different things. Those are the motivating factors. But like motivating factors are just one part of a, a, of a social dynamic. And what they never do. And since I have the platform, I'm going to take it. Do it. I think that all social interactions can be related as energy systems. Okay. And and exactly yeah. as such. So uh-huh. if you take Maxwell's uh-huh. and uh, um, uh, Faraday's and Ohm's equations and just use the resistance capacitance potential circle, you can measure the interactions of people in that way. And I think that's where... And, and again, maybe that's just, that gives me a framework in order to analogize because I understand that maybe there's a better way. And this maybe leads towards that. Like I, I relate it to trauma-based mind control because of Skinner. Like maybe it's my lack of analogies. I only have a subset to pull from and I just lack the knowledge, but someone I think should sit down. And if you've read, uh, um, uh, the art of deception, uh, any of Mitnick books are brilliant. Um, but if you read those books where he is heavily discussing social engineering, he'll do the same thing he'll hint on something that has much deeper concepts that could be explored, but never get to. And I think a lot of that has to do with the, the, I mean, psychology is esoteric to begin with. And so technicians lack the lexicon to bring those together. And again, like, I shouldn't expect a psychologist to, to study technology nor vice versa. So why, you know, it's going to take that particular person, that, that super nerd who is, a social engineer enough as well as understand, say, the DSM-5 enough to be able to say, oh, these are how we're, we're like, because what I'm doing, I'm essentially, this is horrible, I'm essentially inducing neuroses in the people that I'm dealing with. Like, if we were going to get really clinical here, and I'm manipulating those neuroses to my end, I am being a sociopath. So the study of social engineering is the study of sociopathy. There you go. Yeah. And that's what the drill instructors do to the recruits. Absolutely. <laughs> well, they have to break you down first. Yeah. So that's the first part of the, like, I got to interrupt your prior mm-hmm. thoughts. And then, and only then, can I instill new instructions. Mm-hmm. So absolutely, that's boot camp. That's what your drill instructors are for. Precisely that. Yep. Yeah. Seen, uh, and I think they even had this in, like, uh, WandaVision. In the 70s, they had conversation pits. And so you would go into your living room and your living room would drop one step. That's true. And you would have couches and there was, TV didn't, like, TV existed, but it wasn't, you didn't have a TV in there. It was just an area where people could sit. You could fit like 12 people around a coffee table or, or a little bigger. And it was, the name is there. It was a conversation pit. It's where you sat down and you had drinks and you just depressurized and, and chatted. And after a little while, you went from bitching about work to waxing intellectual about the fall of Rome. That's a good thing. And it's just been lost even more. I remember seeing those conversational pits in homes back in the day. Right now they're gone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. By, by the early the '80s, TV, they were gone. Yeah. I asked my grandma, my my grandma, who's like ninety freaking something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's still alive. She, wow. I asked her. I was like, "What's the biggest thing that has changed humanity in your life?" And she said, "The invention of the TV." So I'll, I'll take that one step further. I believe that the that social networking is the next the next step of that same problem. I think that I think that exacerbates that same problem. Like TV isolated families, social media isolates individuals. That's true. You throw up your phone; it's a social seal, shield when yep. you go into public. Well, think like, of, like 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 how dare you walk up and approach and talk somebody to somebody who has a phone in front of their face? And nowadays they'll just be talking to the air because they have an earbud in, and like they'll give you that. Like even if you just try to like, I need to make eye contact because I need to speak to you. They'll give you that. Like how dare you even look at me while I'm yeah. doing this? And don't touch me because right? you're diseased oh, dude, with COVID, <sighs> with a 99% survivability rate. 0.01. Yeah. Dude, that, yeah, I don't even want to get into that. That's, that's, that's so political. Over. 
Yes. Yeah, it is political. Well, whatever. I mean, no one's deplatforming me because nobody gave a fuck about no, me. No, but with, I so. like my my position is such that I like I do have to self censor in in certain cases. Yeah, so. do what you got to do. No, totally. We've been we've been drinking, my friend. Yeah, and even that, and, I'm like again, I'm not going to get super political. Yeah. Every everybody who knows me knows that I what's crazy right leaning. Con- I know conservative, but, but I'm know. in the middle. It, what's nuts is you can't even watch a Joe Rogan podcast without Spotify. You know, putting a label saying yeah, COVID yeah. fact check bullshit. Yeah. So right now, nobody gives a fuck about me, which is fine. And well, I mean, I, I ideally hope that changes. I hope so. Maybe someday. Maybe someday somebody will be like, oh, this dude figured out that Tesla's fucking explode. Do you they- have a regular schedule for this? No. Because... I'm a, <laughs> having read a lot of psychology books, uh, Jung being one of my favorites. Yeah. Probably. Especially in the last two days, a lot of synchronicities. Like a lot of things that I've put out at work, uh, things that have taken months or weeks, they're all rolling together right as they should all together. To, to quote the A-team, I love it when a plan comes together. Mm-hmm. And so funny enough, somebody today said, somebody should put together a podcast, like a weekly podcast for cybersecurity news. Because nobody really does it consistently. And I was like, hey, dude, I'd love to do that. But I need somebody to be able to feed me the content. Like, if you give me the top 10 things I need to talk about, like, I used to be a radio DJ. Like, I'll happily sit down and, and plug whatever you put in front of me. But I don't have the time to write that stuff down. I need somebody else to do it. But I was just wondering, like, if you're on any kind of regular cadence or not, and I certainly enjoy this conversation, it might be cool, synchronistically speaking, to, uh, to sit down and plot something out for, like, a half an hour show every week to go over like you know for me it's going to be interesting cybersecurity stuff but uh, for you as somebody who's a data scientist who who helps people promote their businesses and more importantly their media like this got to be one of the things that you like like I listen to Mr. Beast and when he talks about his productions like he does accuracy by volume yeah except for fire right mm-hmm. <laughs> so he puts out a bunch of videos until he got popular enough that he started putting out good videos then he got popular enough to put out the videos he wanted and I'm just thinking, like, if you have a regular cadence, that would certainly lead to, like, that would certainly help build. I felt like there was this subconscious. Co- this is going to sound crazy. <laughs> You're going to tie right back to my synchronicities. <laughs> um, so going through school, ever since I got out of the Marines and then up to when I was studying. Yeah, go ahead. Put put your foot up against that that. That late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Manipulate it how you need. Either way, don't don't worry about it. I <laughs> should get some WD forty. It's all good. Either way, um, I feel like YouTube has targeted me as an algorithm to be a YouTube person. Oh, you think that like so like if you cut some of this up into shorts and actually put them out because they're really promoting shorts lately. But if you had those shorts lead back to like the full podcast, like you they're what you're saying is like they're favoring enough that you could ride this wave. Like they're giving you a wave to ride. Is that is that what we're saying? Worse. No, the other way they're like sinking you. Yeah. Am I looking at it backwards? No, this is how I've seen it with the people on the network. Like so Danny, the pacemaker bodybuilder and Scott, when he finally started picking up dogs as the thing to start filming and I started creating videos for them and posting those videos. Well, okay, let me go back. YouTube knows what I was learning. YouTube knows everything I've been learning. YouTube puts in front of me other people to hold as a model. I've been modeling these people that I've seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. YouTube knows everything about me, and YouTube was just like daring me about a year ago, like, upload a short, I dare you. Okay. And then no, no, no. So 1,700 that, views. So I maintain. So, yeah, they're they're giving so, you a wave. They're, like, offering you this wave to ride. And they're like, hey, man, like, just do it. We'll, we'll give you this this thing. You just got to run with it. That, and I feel that each platform ha- is specifically tailored in headhunting in that fashion. Okay. for Just in terms of, like, content creators? Content creators. Yeah. Okay. And they know what you're learning. Because you're going to YouTube to look it up. How to totally. this, how to that. And they're like, oh, this dude's learning this. He's consistent with it. Okay, he's hit this check mark. We need to start sending him these videos. Totally. And then I started seeing Yeah, it's just a that, positive reinforcement model. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's genius. Totally. Is what it is. Yeah, from a psychological I'm standpoint. Basically, yeah. I think in terms of the way Google, who owns YouTube, yeah, sees yeah. things. But yeah. I hope that was a long-winded answer to your No, question. it it is. The the 
I think there's a lot of potential in this area, and I think, uh, especially to my specific space, there there are people who attempt to get out there and do news. Uh, you know, we, we have the big ones, uh, Jeremy Bomble and John Hammond, Shannon Morris, you know, that, that come out and do some cybersecurity briefs here and there. Um, but what they lack is consistency. So, like, what they don't realize, I think this is a missed marketing opportunity, what they don't realize is slow weeks happen. So, like, if your weekly update is only 10 minutes because there's only two major things to talk about, that's okay. If your next one is 30 minutes because there's more stuff to talk about, that's fine too. They seem to have this set in their head that like, I have to hit this 20 minute threshold or it's not worth doing. And mm -hmm. so they'll go weeks without content. And all I'm saying is like, better to have one out every week that the algorithm can count on that you're going to be putting it out every week than to do what you're doing. Yeah, that's true. It's better to be a... Quality content's king while, totally. while consistency is queen. But, so, and, and again, let's use, let's use the king of podcasting uh, as an example here. Joe Rogan's early work was a whole lot of shit with just him and his friends being idiots. Mm -hmm. And then when he got big enough, he could start choosing who he wanted. You, you're still in that infantry state. Like, it's okay if All you right. just bring on anybody. Yeah, 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 you just got to. But that's like, that's the thing is like, at that point, the key is the grind needs to be consistent. If it's going to yeah. be two podcasts a week, then come hell or high water, it's two podcasts a week. You mm -hmm. know, that that's kind of, and that's where I think everybody else is failing is they're waiting until they have enough content to talk. And uh, to me, I think that's maybe, maybe that, maybe you're not the talent. Maybe you need somebody else to talk for you mm -hmm. because, you know, yeah, find any DJ, they can fill up, 300 seconds may be a long time, but any DJ can fill up five minutes. Well, people want news. And if you're able, if you think you have a niche that you can target for cyber news, totally. that Let, can let's be give, let's a give very news serious with, thing. Well, yeah. And, and my take on AI it, news is something I do. So the, the what last do you mean by that? AI news, the artificial intelligence news. No, I know what AI means, bro. Like, what do you mean by that's something you do? Meaning what? You, oh. go, you go and ask the thing to prompt you news. You go write articles based on like, oh, what do you that's do? That's a good question. Yes. What do you um, mean by that? So for example, like, before this podcast starts, when I introduce you as a guest, then the next thing I'll go into is, but first, in AI news, we have the development of Llama 2. Llama 2. Oh, I'm so dumb. It's so literal. You mean news about AI. Yeah. Holy shit. I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. I'm so dense. No, that's why I have to talk <laughs> it's about It's literal. That. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm like, yeah, Llama 2. Dude, blah, I, have, blah, blah. I have lots of local llamas. They help me every day. Yep. I yep. have a llama farm. Yeah, and, and so I, so I'll do things like that. Like some podcasts, I'll start with just practicing pitches with um, shares of stock. Like you should buy PepsiCo because they own Frito Lay and all this stuff. Do you know Tom stuff. Lear? No. <laughs> so I'm sorry that thing you said practicing pitches. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of weird segue ADD brain. <laughs> There's a, a great comedian named Tom Lear. He does. He was a mathematician at MIT, and he does a he plays piano. And he does like Weird Al stuff. And one of his songs is Poisoning Pigeons in the Park. And your practicing pitches reminded me because of the puzz of oh, poisoning, poisoning Pigeons, pigeons. in the Park. Yeah, gotcha. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand. I understand. Tom Leary, he was a comedian. Yeah. But, but yeah, anyway. Uh, yeah, well, sorry. No, no so, not to detract. No, no, that's a good segue. So, but yeah, so you you start the, you have these little segments at the beginning of your podcast. Yeah, and one news. of them is AI news, but which is literally you, news about AI. Yeah, so if you thought that you wanted to be the voice of cybersecurity news. Oh, I see what you're saying. Like, I can almost that. have a spot. I get you. Like, if this was a radio show, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, again, like, this other guy pitched the idea. I'm going to make him put some skin in it. So, like, it's going to be on him to go research the news that he expects to see in the newscast. But I'm more than happy to be talent if you're more than happy to be platform. And we can talk about something like that offline. Yeah, so the Blooming Biz Media Network's for right friend. developing businesses. But um, talk about a time you penetration tested something, and you had to use social engineering. Oh, that's every one of them. Um, so and and shout out to uh, Jason Street. So my approach to every penetration engagement is we do a couple hours of OSINT. Um. So that's uh, open source intelligence to those who are not savvy, uh, much like human is human intelligence. And we'll actually do some of that, too. So we'll, we'll usually have somebody do OSINT. So they're doing LinkedIn research and scouring job boards for or uh, uh, the time machine to the Wayback Machine to see what you've posted before, because not only can we find the environment you're operating because you were nice enough to post all of that, but we can probably find who you hired and where they're from. 
and get some behavioral analysis out of that. Um, the human side of it will literally come down. I have a, one of the members of my team is purely surveillance. He does optics. So cameras, binoculars, if you need somebody to sit in a car and watch a spot for hours, like he's, he's, he's your overwatch. So he does all the human and he'll do things like go and pick up the receipt you threw away and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, so you, you get all those groups together. They usually do a couple hours of recon and then I will wing it. So I will, uh, usually look, so, oh, okay. I can give you one cause I don't work there anymore. The last place I worked, we, I did a physical pen test at a logistics center. The, uh, so I, day one, uh, we scout the location. So first finding a location sucked. The maps were not accurate. And I mean the Google maps. So like it was Google maps now does a pretty good job of showing you like the route around, say even your parking lot here before they would just show the road end and there's a big gray spot. Well, in that gray spot, there is actually some alleys and stuff, but they're not on the map. This building was in one of those spots. So it took us a while to find it in the first place. We finally find it. We sit out in their parking lot for a while and we're just watching. Now, the building is badge in entrance. That's how everybody's supposed to get in and out. But it's a logistics center. So that also means there's a receiving center. So there are a couple of docks for trucks. And one of those docks, the damn loading door is open like halfway so i'm like okay we have an rfid cloner we have managed to get close enough to one of the employees to clone their badge if we have to we can badge in but the goddamn door is open so we come back the next day same loading door is halfway open so i have my i have my uh osint is already done we did that the night before just scouring who actually shows up, who works where, blah, blah, blah. And I do some quick Googling and I find out who the local um, temporary job employment people are. So think like Robert Half and, and stuff like that, right? So all my guys, we're getting plans on how we're going to do this. The, the, you know, we've got a Wi-Fi pineapple. We can try to hijack their network uh, we've got a lead on one of the people that we can probably use them in a way I'm not comfortable talking about on the radio that would disrupt some lives. But there's a lot of social engineering stuff that, like, if you need somebody out of the building, I guarantee you, if you have the imagination, you can come up with a reason why somebody shouldn't be in a place. You know, like, their child gets arrested for having drugs in their locker. Like, I would never suggest doing that. But, you know, that would be a reason that would get somebody out of a building quick. So, that's all in your imagination. I don't condone or condemn either of these and make sure you always have permission when you are penetration testing. So <clears throat> we have all this information. We have some easier and more complicated ways of breaking in, but this goddamn loading door is still halfway open. So I say, fuck it guys. I'm just going to try this. So I walk up to the door and I don't step in because my rules of engagement state that I can't lie and I can't outright break into the building technically stepping across the threshold much like a vampire i haven't been invited therefore i'm trespassing so what am i supposed to do i walk up to the to the very edge and i stop and i kind of peek under the door and look around and the first person i see i wave to and they wave and i don't say a thing this is very important in social engineering back to that uh in psychology, there is this concept, uh, I'll paraphrase it, if you let someone talk long enough, they'll go from telling you what they know to telling you what they don't know. Mm. Meaning, if you let someone talk long enough, they'll tell you their whole life story. Mm -hmm. So my first rule is kind of like being in a deposition. Don't offer information you don't have to. Don't look cagey, but don't, don't just be verbose and give out information. So I wave, she waves. There's this moment of awkward, I call it potential. You might call it tension. Mm -hmm. She goes, are you the new guy? First filter. Is it a lie if I answer yes? No. It's not because new. as it turns out, ways. I had been recently hired to the company overall. And so I was indeed new. So mm -hmm. very honestly, I said, yeah, I'm the new guy. And she goes, great, come on in. And much like a vampire, I'm like, that's all I needed. So I walk in and she goes, where are you from? And I said, Robert Half. And she goes, that's weird. We hardly ever get anybody from Robert Half. First red flag. She should have drugged me off right there. What she actually meant was we never get people from Robert Half because they don't use Robert Half as an approved uh, temporary provider. Mm. So she should have taken me off the line right there. But she didn't. 
because I was just so darn nice and I have such a cute smile. And they need help. They did. So this becomes mm-hmm. hilarious, by the way. So she brings me on and she uh, she goes, so what's your background? <laughs> First check, can I lie? Nope. Next check. Do I have any experience that relates to this? <gasps> I do because, and we mentioned this offline, but for the rest of you, uh, I am a high school dropout and a college dropout. Uh, in my dropout life, I worked at Walmart and during COVID, I worked at Walmart for online grocery pickup. So I very specifically have an intimate knowledge of logistics in terms of receiving products, staging them, staging them for an order and then shipping them. So I just tell her that. Yeah, I, I worked Walmart OGP. It turns out they use the same damn handsets, the, the Zebra T72s that Walmart uses. So I'm already familiar with the damn handset. So she gives me her handset, which is logged into her ID. By the way, she is the assistant manager of this facility. Oh. I have admin logins to the, the inventory device, but it gets better. A truck comes in and the product comes off and we have to enter it into inventory. So she walks me over to the laptop and the laptop is open to their inventory control system logged in as her. She mm-hmm. proceeds to have me enter inventory as her. Now, if she hadn't been looking, I literally could have just changed the numbers and walked away with some of the product. But as it was, and since they were kind enough to leave it, I just plugged in my Bash Bunny with my Windows script on it because they had USB ports right there very conveniently. So as I'm entering the information like I was supposed to, I plug in my Bash Bunny and I run a PowerShell script that does what it needs to do to confirm that I do indeed have the accesses that I need to do some serious damage. And I unplug it, pocket it, and <clears throat> that's that. So... Now I'm stocking product on shelves and getting product ready for shipping, for delivery, and then it's lunchtime. So they walk me over to the lunch area, and in the lunch area on the wall is two RJ45 plugs, one of which conveniently says, access. (laughs) So I pop my shark jack into that, and I end map the network, only to find that those centers are actually attached to the larger network at hand. So I ended up end mapping everything. Um... Then, the, then comes the part where I get kicked out. So, and this is hilarious. And I, I like, I, I want the, like, this is how every penetration test generally ends. It's not me in handcuffs, which has happened, but it generally ends with this scenario. The manager who has trained me and loves my work, by the way, can't figure out who's supposed to pay me. Mm. Is it Robert Half or is it the company? Does the company need to track my hours? Now, because of the laws around payroll, this is a very serious thing they have to pay attention to. And because they can't figure out who it is I actually work for, they bring me into the office. And now at this point, even though I have a get out of jail free card, I am literally sweating because it's like, oh, this is over. We're now going to have that conversation. And so they're looking through stuff. How are you going to convince them you're the boss now? (laughs) Different approach. Okay. So... Looking through her system, looking through her system. I can't find you. How do you spell your name? Blah, blah, blah. Looking through the system. Oh, it's like this. It's like this. I happen to glance over and I see the system they're actually using for their temporary workers. And it's an application you can download on your phone and verify. You can self-verify through the phone. So as she's looking for me in the system, I am on my phone going, I have an email here. Let me hang on. I got to find this. But as I'm saying that, I'm actually registering for the app that she is using to look for me. And then filling out the application so that hopefully before she finishes, I will indeed show up in her list. Oh, sweet. (laughs) If I can just stall her long enough, right? No, I'm literally beads of sweat. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So finally she gives up before I can get it registered. She gives up and says, listen, like we can't figure out who's paying you. Like we can't have you keep working if we don't know whose check is getting dropped. Like we don't know any of this. So like, we're going to have to ask you to leave. And I'm thinking like, oh, I already got what I needed. But, you know, that's kind of a bummer that you're kicking me out. She looks at me and says, you're really good at this. And we really need the help. Can you come back tomorrow morning? Sure. <laughs> so I do. I said, yeah, absolutely. I leave. I immediately call my boss and I'm like, dude, we have to talk. And as we're going over it, I find out that the there there's been some there's been some stuff and the the coo is going around to logistics centers and the place he's going to be tomorrow morning is the very place i was going to go into and be like hey your guys security sucks Mm -hmm. so tactfully i was like i think i'm gonna hold off on that 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I just didn't show back up. And then it was like a waiting game of like, okay, are they going to say anything? Because much to their point, they have four hours of somebody they have to pay for. Mm-hmm. Now I was, I was like, technically I was paid, so mm-hmm. it's fine. But there is this person that did four hours of work for them that they can't reconcile. So I'm waiting to hear from this from somewhere down the chain. And I never do. Like, I worked there off the clock, had access to their full inventory for half a day, and nobody ever said anything. It's so believable, too, because I've worked in a lot of places like that where you could just walk in because every place that's like subjects itself to a temp agency is subject to exactly that. And they're just like, whatever, go report to this guy. Yep. And then you work your mindless job. Well, then you're in that yogurt stance. And, and then you're you, just in that, like, I'm confused. Point me where I need to go. I know. And I've thought of this too, working in places like, oh, you're just giving me access to a computer. You're just giving me, uh, you're just okay, leaving. So me that, here. that little kernel and mm-hmm. like, uh, like <laughs> people that hang out with me hate this. I'll walk by a door and it'll say employees only. I will open that door just to see, like, is it locked? Or does that, is that sign literally the only thing preventing me from going into this employees only area? And nine times out of 10, the door just opens. And it's like, oh, it's just on etiquette. Well, that's dumb. Like you trust people. The one thing I've learned in life, don't trust people. <laughs> Dude, I've, I've worked as a janitor and have access to the Every, freaking so everything. So my, my mom worked at a mall when I was growing up. Those were a thing, kids, where lots of people had stores in one spot. So the back halls of the mall are the best way to get around the mall. Mm-hmm. And because my mom worked there, I had gray access to those areas. So I used to roller skate back in those back halls to get around the mall when I wanted to. And I would just pop out of those random doors that say employees only. But they're literally, they're not locked. Anybody can go in and out of them. In fact, and and here, here you go. Here's a number one safety precaution. Uh, and this goes for all you people who've done active shooter training or um, avoid, defend, and, you know, the ADD training, any of that stuff. In places like Walmart, Target, or malls, there are always back areas that just have doors that say employees only. They're totally open. Go through those doors. And beyond those are doors that lead to the outside of the building. That's your way out. If there's an emergency, don't try to go back through the front doors. All of the, there's like in every Walmart, there's 12 exits that aren't fire exits, but they're all behind this like invisible 12 foot area. That's the edge of all of the walls in Walmart. Just beyond that is a whole other space that has exits everywhere. Like be aware of those things. That's situational awareness. If you're doing fire danger. Right. But that's again, even back to what you're saying, this Mm -hmm. is a matter of just like OSHA fire safety, Mm -hmm. like know your surroundings. There's a reason in every hotel room, there is a map from where you are to the fire exit. Like pay attention to this stuff. Or even if you're not like, I'm going to study this, just be aware that those things are even there. And I think that goes back to my like employees only. And like, I check to see the door is locked, not just to mess around, but it's also like, oh, is this a viable way out if things got weird? Like, if all else failed and I had to go somewhere, could I go through here? Oh, I can. That's interesting. That opens up a bunch of other possibilities. So it's, it's that. And I think a lot of people are so programmed into etiquette that simple things like signs lead them to believe that, say, a gun-free it's zone is actually a gun-free zone. Yeah, yeah. To no. use a literal analogy. No, everything you talked about makes me think about how they try to condition us. Yeah, we call it predictive programming to go yeah. back to Skinner. As children to think in a box and and everything in this box has these rules and you yeah. have to follow these rules. But that's the, the hacker mentality is that kernel that's always that what if. Mm-hmm. But what if I do this? What happens to the system if I introduce this variable? And that's where I found system architecture and system theory so interesting. I just think of it as science. It is, yes. Yeah, yeah. To, to the traditional scientific method, mm-hmm. not to whatever science is now, Lord help us, about this being a lost art of conversation, that that to uh, sit down and wax intellectual. So I've had discussions with a socialist uh, over several years, and what we came down to was that the best thing we could probably do to maintain the republic is every 25 years, which is roughly a generation, is wipe out all the statutes and replace them like wipe them out to baseline so back to constitution and then keep keep or immediately add the laws that are priorities so this would be tantamount to like if you're at work and you have all these things going on and you just went into your email and deleted everything and then just waited for who spoke up first like who needed something first 
And as soon as that got brought up, that would be the first thing we deal with. So if we were to wipe out all the statutes now and go right back to constitution and then immediately start looking at something there, there are some laws that we need to immediately put in place. And so we start there and build our way back up as opposed to whatever it is we're doing now. But all of that came from being able to sit down and have an open and honest discussion between people. And I think even to some of our earlier uh, talk about social media use, when I say a free and open discussion, I, by open, I mean no fear of expressing an idea. I think that we suffer a lot of that now, where people may have good ideas, but they fear expressing them because they may be heteronormative. You self-censor a lot. A lot. Oh, I know I do. I catch it all the time. Yeah. And that's part of what I think is interesting is things that people used to say, they don't say. Yep. Which is weird. It is. Or in in a furtherance of that aspect, not only do we not say what we used to, but now we say things contrary to what we believe openly. Yeah. Which is further weird. Like, right. Like, if you really want to get weird, this is double think as described by... In George Orwell. Yeah, by yeah. Orwell. Right. So, like... While I, while I totally at the functional level understand that people can hold two contradictory positions, I, I prey on that often in social engineering. At the same time, like, symbolic logic has a place. Like, use it. <laughs> like, I, I just, it baffles me how many people, uh, we, we, oh, wow, we, we have a phrase for it. We call them surface level thinkers. Uh, if we were playing chess, there are people that only think one move ahead. Right? Mm. The, the people that I get along with tend to be three to five move thinkers. They, they, they think ahead of not just the move, but the consequences and then the other actions they can make from those consequences. So like, those are people I like to engage with. They can, they can get past that surface, that the surface level thinking just leads to reactionaryism. And so nothing gets accomplished. Like you need somebody uh, in cybersecurity uh, and, and probably in data science. I don't know if you guys do this, but in the military you did, we call them tabletop exercises. You guys would call them field exercises. Same idea. So like we run like in my team, I kind of instantiated this. We run tabletop exercises at least every quarter where we run an, a scenario as if it was an incident and play it through. And that gets my SOC analysts and my other guys working together and working through their response plan. They wrote the response plan, but now they get a chance to play it out. And through that, learn what works and doesn't work in our process, not just in our techniques. So there, there's, there's things like that. People don't tabletop things enough anymore. And I mean, they need to do that about all their ideas, not just about any given and certainly not just about politics. Like if anything is worth thinking about, it's worth thinking about more than one move in, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. That's a good point. You're right. If you, the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in combat. Nice. If you're not yeah. practicing, if you're not flexing that muscle of cybersecurity, you're not going to be efficient as a cybersecurity team. Yeah. Okay. So, and that brings up a, so that's an interesting point to the individual, the, so, and I use this phrase loosely, I mentor some people locally and remotely. And that's one of the things that we've primarily, like the thing we've honed in, we do career grooming, we do resume building, we do all the stupid regular stuff. But the one thing that I've done specifically for cybersecurity is we do labs. So we get on, uh, here's some shout outs for people that want to get into cybersecurity, don't know what they're doing. If you have even the, if you can turn on the computer and send email, start with PICO, that's P-I-C-O, C-T-F, capture the flag, dot org, I believe it is. Uh, this is a capture the flag system that's aimed at like high schoolers. It was perfect introductory level. Then you have things like try hack me, try hack me has a bunch of labs, but they also have paths. So if you want to learn to be a red team or a penetration tester, you can go down that path. If you want to learn to be a blue team or a SOC analyst, you can go down that path. If you want to be a purple teamer or a cyber manager, you can go down that path. But each of those paths is just a series of labs that accentuate the knowledge that you need for that path, but they're still all hands on labs. So we get people in those labs and we work with them and train them to do these hand on, hands-on practical skills. That, that's where people are missing. And again, I think that's not just like, that's a practical application of what we're saying, even to the art of conversation. The, in order to have conversations like this, you have to have conversations like this. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's social media takes away from that. Uh, television, just like, like they said, you know, in the, in the 60s and 70s, takes away from that. I think, I think we lose that. Look, you have literally built an artificial conversation pit in your own place here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder why that is the case. Why people, 
I think people are just already defeated. They're so damn self-defeated in the fact that it's like, I feel like, I think they think that they are already so hacked that it doesn't matter. While a long suffering chain of abuses is tolerable to be suffered, so shall it be. To horribly paraphrase the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. We could probably bring it up pretty quick and we get the direct quote, but something to the effect of people will suffer while suffers are sufferable. They do. Yeah, yeah. And I think that people believe that Big Brother is bigger than what it is. I think they attribute to it more organization than is there. So you coming mm -hmm. from the military would laugh at anybody who tried to tell you like, oh, they're so organized and structured, they get shit done. Have you, like, there's a reason Milspec's a joke. You don't want anything Milspec. That's mm -hmm. like, that's the, wor that's the, the baseline worst you can get. It's the baseline. Lowest bitter. Right. It's the baseline. It's not the exception. So it's like, like, look, at, look at the evolution of optics for the military. And like it, every time it's a civilian solution that becomes the solution for you guys. Red dots, uh, low magnifiers, the, the flip up magnifiers, the PDQs, all of those were civilian in instruments that were then moved over because somebody was like, well, why don't I just pack the IR and flashlight in one unit? And sell it for like three times the amount of the. Rifle. Are you familiar with the? <laughs> are, are you familiar with the invention of basketball? And this is probably apocryphal. Uh, go ahead and tell me. So the idea is, sometime in the fifties, basketball was invented. When they invented it, it was a a a stand with a basket, a, a peach basket that had its full bottom. And so they would make a basket. And somebody have to get a ladder, climb up, and get the ball out. So eventually they put a hole in it and some of the, the weave was far enough that the ball would go in and get kind of stuck. And they had like a little chain and pulley that would kind of open it up so the ball would fall down. Right. So now you don't have to get a ladder, but you still got to go over and pull this thing. Anyway, it took 50 years to get from solid bottom basket to netted hoop. We literally started at the stupidest version and then had to work our way through multiple iterations to get what we would now consider the natural and obvious solution. And here's the best part. That's not the outlier. That's all human invention. I know. I feel like that's my life. We create the dumbest version first and then beat ourselves into what should be the natural version. Dude, that's all of human invention. Yeah. Like, don't, don't find yourself like going, oh my God, why does this happen? No, dude, this always happens. This is the prey to distribution in action. The dumbest idea always wins. Why? Because everybody can understand a dumb idea. Mm -hmm. That's true. And I'm glad you're talking at an eighth grade reading level right now, because that's important for the audience. That's something I always think about when people start talking all techie. No, my, so like, I'm far from tech. So that's the best part. Like the, how you do one thing is how you do everything. I'm a high school dropout. I'm a college dropout. Dude, the, the path to success is least resistance. I'm not good because I necessarily ground everything out. I'm good because I looked at a system and went, what's the easiest way to get into this system? And then I used it every time. And that's back to that social, like, it's easier to wing it and line myself in than it is to try to come up with some convoluted plan that's going to require me to drop out of a helicopter through an air vent, down through a laser grid, and blah, 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 when I could just walk in in a UPS uh, fucking uniform with a box in my hand. And people will literally open the door for me. I could be like, God, this box is heavy. I don't have a carrier. People will literally open the door for you. They'll let you in anywhere. I could stand at the server room door in a UPS outfit, and somebody would open the door for me if it looked like I was struggling. The goddamn IT operator who knows better will open the door for me. I think that's how Ted Bundy got away with so many murders. Let's not go into attention right. on serial killers. I know a lot of weird random data about serial killers. Well, so, people are obsessed with them. Well, monsters I'm, border the, the, the monsters police the borders of reality. Ooh, I like they, that. they yeah, they they remind us of what is real with human nature. You know what they remind me of? So the, to circle back to something I said earlier, they remind me of my lack of imagination. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. Because no matter what I think is horrible, I, I'm certainly lacking in imagination. Mm hmm Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's yeah, that's why, that's why I like the way you put that. You're right. They do kind well, of defend the, they kind of define the edge of what is real in the sense of realm or what is reality in that same sense of realm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah, it's, and we're enthralled with them. Yeah. We, we, no, I'm, I'm only, so true. I'm interested in it at that autistic level. Like I like Bundy for the way he used the sympathy ploy mm -hmm. masterfully done. 
but again, so well but done. again, that's a pattern. So you like notice, like I have a name for it. It's the sympathy ploy. Like I have names for all of these things. There are lots. They're all con. They're all con games. If you watch like Ocean's Eleven and they're talking about like, well, we could do a brick a Brooklyn Double or like, no, we could do a Kansas City Shuffle. Like those are names for cons. Like that's what we're doing. Like the, that's the trick. The trick is to be a con man. And that's what to the very first thing I said of unwarranted confidence. That like I was born with unwarranted confidence. I can stand on stage in front of one person or tens of thousands. I get no anxiety. It doesn't do anything to me. So I've always had that that undue sense of confidence. So like it plays really well. I'm a natural social engineer because whatever I tell you is the truth, I believe it, so you're going to believe it. And that's all it takes. It's like full commitment to the character, full method acting. Like mm-hmm. look at Joaquin Phoenix as the Joker. Yeah. yeah. How far are you willing to take the act? And that's really like... So when we were talking about like when we go from the confused to the I belong here to the you don't, mm-hmm. or as you were saying, from yellow to black when I flip mm-hmm. it all the way around, that's very much in that same realm where I'm, I'm, I'm executing patterns that I, I know, but what I'm actually doing is I'm, I'm executing cons. They're, they're all ploys. They're just they're ploys that have different angles. And that's what we hint on in social engineering when we say that, you know, watch out for emails that have a false sense of urgency. That false sense of urgency, like, Pay more attention to that. It, it's actually talking about a system you're not discussing. And it's a system that you react on, but you won't even acknowledge you do it. That's where I like to play. I like to play in that part where your use to routine and my ability to disrupt that messes with you. I enjoy seeding that chaos. For example, I'll get into a meeting and people will be like, hey, hey, how's everybody doing? They'll be like, hey, Casey, how are you? And I'm like, no. That's it. No other words, nothing. I'll unmute and go, no and mute just to fuck with people. I just want to see how they'll react. Some people laugh. Some people get real quiet, but I, like, I like to do that. I like to, I like to poke the social situation to, to interfere with the system, to cause perpetrations within the system and see how the system reacts. Mm-hmm. And it could be one-on-one or it could be a group of people. I don't care. You should start doing jujitsu. <laughs> I, I am a martial artist. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a swordsman. I've, I've, I've done my fair share of martial arts. I, I f- have full respect for the discipline. And the, so before I, I had mentioned that, uh, <laughs> that it was, that one was similar to, uh, Buddhists in, in the way they look at things. And what I meant by that is like Buddhists have Cohen's Cohen's are nonsensical statements that break your mind from thinking. So the one that everybody knows is the sound of one hand clapping. Describe to me, so the Buddhist monk will say to the acolyte, describe to me the sound of one hand clapping. It's a nonsense statement. The more you think on it, the less it makes sense. This is the point. Another great koan is, show me an immovable tree in a strong breeze. Same thing, nonsense statement. In fact, there are no words that can describe that koan. The answer is nonverbal. The appropriate answer to that koan is nonverbal. So I like doing that. I like taking a situation where people have expectations of how the social interaction should flow and then arbitrarily interrupting them to see how they react. Hmm. So that could be tonally or emotionally. So I will react with an inappropriate emotion to whatever the circumstance is and weird emotions. Not like anger, because that's the one people go to, but like confusion in something that's very clear. Because it just, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like parts of it are roots of some comedy. Like Bill Hader's comedy is is deeply rooted in what i just said so like that's what i like to do i like to fuck with people socially it's all in good fun but people are so reliant on their pre-predictive programming that i like to interrupt it and just see how they to circle back to zen those interruptions force you to live in the moment suddenly all your preconceived notions are gone and you have to deal with reality as it is right now you know what nobody's ready for that so I love throwing people into that state of mind to see how they react. That's it. That's like the core of it. Like all of my social engineering comes from the root of wanting to fuck with people in that way. To to react in unpredictable manners to social situations that would otherwise be predictable. That's that's the core of it. Isn't it fun? It dude, I love it. Like I thrive on it. That's like I think it's people like people are like happy life. Friday and I'll unmute and be like, bah humbug and mute. You're right. It's part of like a divine comedy. So, you know where I first realized it was court. You get in court, judge comes in, everybody stands up, everybody sits down. Before I had figured out what the fuck is going on, the action had taken place. Everyone around me had stood up. 
and everyone around me had sat down without a signal. The bailiff hadn't even said, all rise. Everybody just knew, get up, and then sit down. And I did nothing. And then I got called out for it. They're like, do you have no respect for the decorum of the court? To which I answered, I have no idea why these people all just did that. Or why you're wearing a muumuu. By the way, judges hate it when you say that. Don't say that. I imagine. <laughs> but I have like zero fucks to be given anywhere. Well, that's exciting. <laughs> that's exciting. So for me, because it's all a social experiment. Mm-hmm. And like a judge is the only one that can actually and has ever actually been able to do this. So like if we're having a debate and you want me to do something and I don't want to, uh, I'll give you an example. So like. If I go to a store and I'm playing with a Nerf football and they tell me not to, my question is, what are you going to do if I don't? Like, are you going to put hands on me? Are you ready to assault and batter me over a Nerf football? How far are you willing to take this? And it's not like a, I'm going to die over this Nerf football. It's more of a social experiment. Like, like actually, how far are you willing to take this before you call somebody else in to do it? How far are you willing to call this up the chain? Are you willing to call the cops on me for a Nerf football? But I'll play it out. That's the difference between me and most people. I'll play it out, which does, by the way, end you up in holding occasionally. I just think of like <laughs> people in Walmart, like a Walmart worker and two people with a nerd football in Walmart. Right. That's exactly what I'm talking and about. How would that escalate? That's what I'm saying. So they come and talk to me and they're like, hey, you need to stop. Like, that's my first question. It's like, or else what? What are you going to do? Like, you going to grab me, bro? You going to talk to me sternly? You going to write me a letter? Like, mm-hmm. what are we talking about here? What are the actual consequences now? And so like, I, you know, that's, I like to see how real people are in any given circumstance and occasionally in inappropriate circumstances that I probably shouldn't. I know I do that <laughs> shit too. And sometimes I wonder about myself. Oh no, dude. That like the comedian from the Watchmen had it right. Like at best, this is one of many parallel simulations, right? At worst, this is one of many multiverses contained within a hyperdimensional space at really worse. This is it. So, in the end, it's all a joke. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean that nihilistically. I mean, have fun with it. Like, because in the end, this is all a joke. Like, don't let it get you down. And like, none of, like, again, not to sound nihilistic, like, none of it matters. Like, that email you didn't answer today, in the scope of things, it doesn't matter, bro. Sleep well. You're not being shot at. Mm-hmm. That's gen- my general response. You got lead coming down range at you? No. Then what's your problem? Sounds like a good damn day. Mm-hmm. right you got ieds in the road no this sounds like an awesome day it's all relative and mm-hmm. i think that's the problem people lose their relativity people think that relative is their normal scope and they lose reference to everything else you know your day is meh relative to everything else like there's a great book the child called it about a kid that just gets abused by their natural family and comes out of it and ends up being a great person and mentors other people you know into being good people like Your life isn't anywhere as bad as that, guys. And it's nowhere near as good as George Soros. So just, like, keep your relative reference in mind, you know? Like, sure, it was a shitty day. Are you homeless? Well, then I guess it wasn't that shitty. Are you hungry? You can eat? Well, I guess it wasn't that shitty. You know, it's all just relative reference. And I think people lose it. They lose their reference. They, uh, maybe they live too much in their ego, not enough in the present. Like, who knows? You know, everybody's got their neuroses. But I think on... A whole people have a general lack of of reference. This is this is Einstein's relativity. Like everything has to be like for anything to matter, it has to be relative to something else. So make sure you don't just pick something and go, "Oh, my life sucks because I'm not Brad Pitt." Right, but your life's great because you're not the homeless crackhead down the street. Like it's all relative, bro. Relativity is a thief and bringer of joy. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it cuts both ways. It 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 is uh, it is the tool. It it means not harm and it means not good. It it just is. Yep. So yeah, that's uh that's the way I see that. Well, good. That's a really great <laughs> point. And I found myself doing that shit too. I just never wanted to be somebody to sit and conform with. This is how things go. And I think about how do you get a job at Google? And I think about the time I spent at Microsoft at their campus and touring and listening to everybody and they all said the same thing you basically need to move here and find somebody that works here 
to get in. It's a it basic, and it didn't look. Yeah, yeah. It it it's like a cult you have to infiltrate. And I think about nine eleven. Like, how did nine eleven happen? It happened insurgently. It happened insurgently. Small people getting in, working their way up. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's that fifth column mentality. Fifth column. What's that? Uh, media reference, cultural reference, Babylon Five, probably a couple others. Um, generally speaking, the fifth column is the rebellious force uh, against any given system. So the, the oh the yin to the yang. It's the insurgent side of the political force. So like, the cyberpunk storyline follows it to a T. Uh, Keanu Reeves' character in that is exactly that character. Um, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, that gets into a whole different set okay. of stuff. Okay, gotcha. So, um, how does... Where do you think the future of cybersecurity is going? That's fairly nuanced, but there's... so Yeah, that's true. To look at it through your lens of interest, I think... Artificial intelligence has added some very interesting nuance to the cybersecurity discussion. And with that, I need to pause for a moment. Cause okay. Well, I got to use the restroom. But I know where I am, so I'll come back. About Han Sharf, go. Oh, no, it's fine. We were, we were talking about cybersecurity, yeah, the future cybersecurity, thereof, yeah. and artificial intelligence. So I had a discussion with my CISO, uh, who's my direct report. And we were, uh, when like, he knew I was using AI. So I use... I use GPT-3.5 for, I use uh, GitHub Copilot in my Visual Studio code. I use Bing Copilot on my desktop for search. And I have five or six local llamas that I have built for specific things. Uh, a couple of which are kind of social experiments where I've taken somebody that I knew in life who's passed on and fed it all of their written information. And I now ask them questions about their life. Yeah, there was a Black Mirror episode of. I need to watch like that, dude. Oh, you're like good. the you're like the eighth person who has <laughs> you like need to watch I've it. said something and somebody's like, dude, there's a Black Mirror episode. Like, I need to watch it, obviously. Like, yeah. And I don't read sci-fi, so here's another thing. There's a bunch of times where I'll say something and my friend will be like, dude, that's from Asimov, or dude, that's from this. Is like I don't read sci-fi. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> well, you alluded to something earlier when you talked about energy between people. Yeah, yeah, and... yeah. Social interactions as an energy system. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it made me think about a law that i learned about oh law. It, a law yeah. it's called metcalf's law yeah i know metcalf so metcalf's law is your network is the square your network is your net worth so your network is the square of the right. number it's, of nodes in the right system. it's an inverse square law to a node graph yeah mm -hmm. totally so yeah that's no, what that, you're the, alluding oh, dude, that, to well, hold on wow sorry that's the other part of my autism i visualize things like I just saw all that. That that's actually a really good insight, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a wow. Law. Okay, yeah. So I know people notice as scientific observers of things, they notice laws of nature. No, totally. Mm -hmm. No, no. A lot of a lot of so like, well, again, to, to circle way back to the to the Bible topic. So the the Old Testament is a very good psychoanalysis of a culture. So in those parables, like in Leviticus, the the laws around not eating shellfish or, or pork. Well, that's because of improper cooking and not understanding bacteria, trichinosis, these other things. So they were codified as religious laws, but they were actually just regular safety laws, right? So it's cool to be able to look back at those things and separate that kind of stuff. That same mix, like porcupines throw their quills, which mm -hmm. is just a safety lesson of stay the fuck away from porcupines. They don't actually throw their quills, but it's a good story. Stay the fuck away from porcupine. So... Those get embedded into our cultures and into our stories, and I think we find that everywhere. It's at scale. It's kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah, like don't drive Teslas. They'll blow up on you. Only if you get in water. But, I mean, who would have thought chemistry? Yeah. It's crazy. So, lithium and sodium are perfectly stable in water. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. And that's another that's another cold. I've never had more pushback than I have with the Tesla findings. The, the Tesla findings? Yeah, because I was... I Okay. I reported on Tesla. Tesla posts their data sets of their fatalities. Oh, now hang on. Good, good data set. Good data set sanitization. Is that reported from the vehicle? Is that reported from the vehicle and other people? Meaning, if a Tesla clipped me and I reported it, but the Tesla owner didn't report it, does that get included in the data set? 
No, this is just deaths. Just their data set of things they recorded. Of deaths. Oh, of fatalities. All right, so it's a biased subset. Okay, continue. Yeah, what's interesting about the biased subset is they try to skew it in the view of autopilot deaths, autopilot-related deaths, but what they failed to... What As they, in an airplane? Because I, I, I'm a pilot. Yeah, well, they're just what? talking about autopilot deaths, but here's the thing is they had Those... a column called description, all right? So they had a column description where people described yeah. the death, the accident. The incident, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I mined through that, and I looked for the words fire and its synonyms. Oh, interesting. You did like a heuristic pass. I did a... Dis- I mean, it's technically a regression pass of the data set. We won't get very technical, but yes, I, I totally get what you're getting at. You did an associative analysis. Yeah, and so of the Tesla deaths... Of yeah, related fire to fire in synonyms. The, in the synonyms, it was 14.5% of deaths will involve fire or awesome. its synonyms. So it's important to involve the synonyms because people who want to avoid No, the this is natural language problem. Fire. No, no, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Well, and you got to think about like uh El Fuego. So you have like you have other languages that these reports would be in too. So it's not just their synonyms, but it's their counterparts. This is straight from Tesla. Sure. So Not to, but are you going to tell me every one of those was in English? It was all in English. Okay, then were any of those translated? No, they're all in English. How do you know? They just were. How do you know that they didn't translate them from a Spanish incident mm. into English? But much to your natural language issue. Yeah. And <coughs> so what I did is I found a bigger data set. That was the countrywide data set that okay. had nothing to do with Tesla yeah. deaths. Yeah, this was all. This is like trying to predict traffic accidents. No, you're, you're, through... taking, you're taking PA plus PB uh, minus mm. PA times PB. I, yeah, I got you, bro. Yeah. yeah, you're taking the exclusion set. Well, the bigger data set right. is the baseline comparison. Yeah. And to give you the I, differential. I mined through that, and I looked, if they had a description column too, and I looked for fire and its synonyms. And so the national standard of U.S. traffic deaths with fire and its synonyms is point, 0.3%. So that means 30 out of 10,000 yeah. deaths will involve fire. fire. Right. So if we were all so, what dead, happens when you take that 03 percent and remove the differential of the sixteen or the fourteen percent of Teslas out of that set? Well, if we just scaled every car, right? So now we're doing a per capita to an EV to a Tesla. Sure. We're all driving Teslas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What that means is, for every one thousand deaths, one hundred and forty-five will involve fire or its synonyms. Right from the te- from the Tesla only perspective. Mm-hmm. Right, and if that's Tesla as a baseline, how much worse is Ford going to be? Sure. Or anybody else for that matter. Mm-hmm. Yep. So the the push for EV. Is this the kind a, of stuff that you cover in, in your uh, your little clips before the podcast? Oh, uh, not before. Oh, okay. uh, I haven't covered Tesla yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I'm, but I'm, I'm done... just getting used to your format. Like we, we met for the listeners. We met a, a week ago or so. And yeah, yeah like I've, I got I, I went through Rob's uh, recording because I know Rob. So it was just neat to listen to. Um, but yeah, like I, I'm, I'm still getting kind of used to, to your format there. You're not on Spotify. What the hell? <laughs> you know, I've tried <laughs> with Spotify. They keep giving me hell over the RSS feed with my Squarespace website and <clears throat> whatever. I've just mostly focused on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And when I'm done with my book, I'm just going to do an audio book straight to YouTube. I'm not going to bother putting it in published print. Sure. I'm going to go straight to audiobook. Yeah. In fact, one of my best pieces of content on my channel is an audiobook that I read. It just keeps growing. Yeah, I've I've been told I have a face for radio. Voice for radio. Yeah, well, keep going with it. <laughs> keep but, going with it. So there's a there's a I've been interested in doing this. I've never I've never had the time to really sit down and do it, but I've wanted to take um so I've mentioned that I'm 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 anarchist leaning in the entomological sense of no rulers. So in that spirit, I like the philosophers like Lysander Spooner, who is a uh, 18th, you know, 1800s uh, lawyer. He essentially created FedEx, and then the government sued him, saying that post delivery is the sole jurisdiction of the of the U.S. government, given the postal requirements within the Constitution. And he said, "To hell with you! I there's no reason I can't privately do this." They shut him down, but his legal arguments about why they should leave him alone establish what amounts to true anarchism in the sense of government exists and we have to interact with it, but it should, it should interfere with us as little as possible. 
So uh, that, that's, I've always, like, that's in common, that's in the common domain. And so I've always wanted to sit down. It's maybe 65 pages. But the same kind of thing. Like, I've always wanted to sit down and just do that. Just read that through. It's maybe four and a half hours spoken out. Hmm. But, you know, you know, time allowances, having a, a studio enough to record, to be able to get decent audio, all that good stuff. It's, you know, just never really allows. And I've been focusing on my on my career and and now going back to school. So I dropped out of college 15 years ago, and now I'm going back to college for cyber cybersecurity, which is funny because I've spent 25 years in the field. So now I go back and, you know, with the exception of stuff that I've still never used, like basic linear algebra, other than linear regression, I've never had a reason to use slope intercept. I've never had like I've never had a reason to use any of this crap they're making me learn, and they've never taught me anything useful like set theory. Why didn't anybody set, teach me set theory? Like how useful, like actually useful the set theory has been but nope that's not something they ever teach us mm-hmm. so you know that's kind of funny yeah that's an interesting point and it makes me wonder like what's the how much is a degree worth nowadays i funny enough had that discussion earlier today um with somebody who's looking to get into school for cybersecurity, and they have that same conundrum of they have work experience they think they need some book knowledge. They think that book knowledge is stored solely in a university, not realizing that Barnes & Noble has all of that information. And furthermore, that most of it's probably free on YouTube anyway. So, that, yeah, it's a, <clears throat> I think it's just a, humans love and appeal to tradition. That's the way we've always done it. So that's how we're going to keep doing it. It's definitely a money-making institution. It is. It certainly is. Um, I believe... Like, I, I full-heartedly believe in there being the idea of certifications, much more to the idea of a, a journeyman and a fellow to a master. So, like, I, I'm a college dropout, but the reason that I get the jobs that I do is I've been in the field, and the field experience is worth more, interestingly enough, than the college experience. So, when I'm talking to people and they see I've been doing this for 20 years, like, they're they're just like they start talking to me about what I know and it's like oh yeah we built systems like that we've done that yeah we've we've run into these problems they're like they because I've been there we did it we didn't read a book about it and theorize it like we did it and that's what we like I find that's the overall disconnect between schooling in general and career field and it's it's that it's almost that same social mystique of people not being able to describe what social engineering really is in terms of that psychological impact and the patterns used to uh, disrupt thoughts and things. Nobody tells you that you don't need a degree. You can learn all that knowledge for free and you can actually grind it out and do those things yourself. You know, much like a, you're a woodworker. You know what I said? Like hearing somebody describe it and then doing it are very different things. So that's, you know, yes, go learn about it. Go, go learn what the industries and academia and everybody says that things should be called, but then go do it. And go realize that everything they said only works in an ideal world and you don't live in an ideal world. The implementation of the things you've read, they don't work anything like described. And you have lots of problems to solve just to get this thing running. Because that's that's the real world. And anybody, like, you're lucky because, well, lucky or not, you learned it in the military that, you know, no plan survives initial contact with the enemy. Well, mm-hmm. no project survives initial contact with implementation. Same Same issues. You can plan it all you want. As soon as you actually start doing it, you realize, oh, even though we looked at the technologies and we read the documentation, it said that it works like this. It doesn't. So now we have to create a whole new system to deal with whatever it was we were trying to solve, which is usually like an ELT problem, you know. <laughs> which brings up another good point, which I was I thought about. What is the difference between obtaining a hack and subs- sustaining a hack? Oh, so you're talking about the difference between what we call initial compromise and persistence. There's a couple steps. So initial compromise is my actual vector in. My preferred methods are lying to people to let them f- to let me physically into where I need to be. The reason I need to be there is so that I can drop off what we call the next step, which is lateral movement or pivot. So I have to drop a device, get on a terminal. I have to do something technical in order to get an actual foothold into the system. Once I have that, we call that pivot. So I've, I'm physically in the building. Now I need to pivot to the network, right? All right. Once I've pivoted or moved laterally, meaning I'm in a system with no permissions, but I move to a system that has better permissions, 
when I've done that lateral movement or that pivot, the next step is persistence. That's the other step you're talking about. Persistence, persistence depends on the environment. So I'm, I like the path of least resistance. So I will get into a location, get onto their network and watch. After a while, I'll start to see where they have protocols that might allow me to do something. So that's when we start using like exploit DB, Metasploit, some of these other tools that have databases of vulnerabilities. So if I see there's an Apache server and I can get the version, I start looking for vulnerabilities. So, you know, Spring for Java, jQuery, you name it. Any Anything in the application stack, I look for vulnerabilities that exist. If I can find something where a vulnerability already exists and somebody wrote a script, all the better. I just download the script, tweak it a little bit, run it. Great. That, that persistence mechanism takes lots of forms. It can be as simple as creating a startup service that creates a callback. So deep in your registry, I'll make sure that every time Windows boots up, it, it starts up Netcat and Netcat is listening on a particular address and port. And maybe it even calls out to me and says, here's a URL to reach back in through network address translation to get to me directly. So that's my persistence. Or maybe it's creating a local account on a system, or maybe it's taking a local account and escalating the privileges to an administrator and then adding a domain account. Or maybe it's taking over an existing daemon and adding arbitrary code. Maybe it's changing the command line argument so that not only does it spin up your code, but it spins up mine too. So there's lots of ways to get persistence, but <clears throat> it, there's always that kill chain essentially where we have the initial compromise, we have lateral movement, we have persistence, and then we have in persistence, we have command and control, and then we have exfil. So that callback is my command and control. And then my exfil is once I have a persistent connection, I can create a tunnel between the victim and myself. Now I'm going to pull the data, implant ransomware, whatever it is we're going to do. So for me, I just rickroll everybody because I'm old school. So like my bash bunny, it, when you plug that into a Windows machine, it runs to a uh, non-monetized, so there's no ads, rickroll video on YouTube. Same thing on Apple. I just have mm. to flip the switch. Cool. <clears throat> on the uh, on one the rubber ducky, it spins up a it opens up the text editor and just gives you a little message uh, that tells you to report that the message got there. And when you report it, we know that it opened up Notepad, which essentially means that I have the same permissions that if it was an executable that was my own, it would have run. For your sake, it was Notepad. Lucky you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's generally how we roll. And for people who are interested in stuff like that, particularly the covert physical entry and uh, uh, USB bashing, um, again, Jason Street, his name is spelled funny. It's J-A-Y-S-O-N, Street, like a street. Um, he's one of the best in our field and is definitely one of the most prominent culturally. So uh, like, pay attention to what he does. He's got lots of videos. He's got a Dark Web Diaries episode. I believe it's episode six. Um, like follow that guy, listen to what he does. If, if your job is getting into places like him and Deviant Olam, that's another, well, Deviant Olam is a group of people, but they do uh, covert physical entry. So again, they're the ones that'll teach you how to use lock picks, how to use uh, underdoor tools, uh, slip latches, stuff like that. All that, all that physical stuff when you come up against doors, those are the guys. Underdoor to. tools. Yeah. I've got a couple, I've yep. got those at home. You do? That's I was cool. going to, I was actually going to bring one here, but where do you find those? Uh, red-tools.com that is huh. run by uh, Deviant Olam, another shameless sponsor. Run or uh, red-tools.com. Cool. <laughs> I remember hearing about that, and I thought, oh, I, I can't, awesome. I can't stress. Like, if you are just getting into cybersecurity, or or interested in these things, you've watched hackers, or you've watched Mr. Robot, or whatever, and you want to get into this stuff. The cool thing about today's day and age is there are people like Network Chuck, John Hammond, Shannon Morse. Uh, uh, Jeremy Bumble, there's all these people who are in the field or who interview people who are in the field and they talk about all this stuff. And depending on who you're looking at, like John Hammond does actual penetration testing, shows you what he's doing, shows you the code, how to run it. You have Shan Morris, who uh, uh, Morris, who works for Hack5. She does more of the cultural and news side of cybersecurity. Like there's lots of resources to pull from. Um, like just pick your poison and, you know, pick who you can stand and listen to and, and go for it. Like, just start listening. It's kind of what I was telling other people, like grind it out. And if worse, by chance, you'll learn something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I started down that world and I didn't really think about finishing it, but someday I, I, I've learned a little bit. I have been told a little bit about the world of SQL injections. No, no. It sounds like you asked somebody and they didn't have an answer for you. <laughs> I'm just, I'm joking. Oh, I mean, I, 
I'm not. As a, as a big data guy, yes, I imagine you've heard some things about SQL injection. Are, are you curious about SQL injection? No, I just don't even know what I... Here's the thing. Even if you were to inject a database and query all their data or just query their data without... I guess that would be the no, best no, no. way to do you it. You totally misunderstand what I can do. Oh, so, no. Okay. No, no, no. I, it's Go not ahead. just a matter of like reading your schema or reading your table. So the 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 SQL injection is not direct SQL injection, meaning I'm not sitting at SQL's command line typing straight SQL commands. What I'm doing is I'm taking advantage of the interpretive language above SQL, mm. not SQL itself. I expect SQL to act exactly as it will. Okay. What I need to take advantage of is how PHP is interpreting it above it. So PHP runs on. I'm top just using of an SQL? example. P PHP is just an example, but yes. So. Your database is just your database. It's your data abstraction layer that's the important part. Your data abstraction layer is usually an API, but it could be anything. It could be an ODBC connection, whatever. Above that is the application layer, for those of you that are unfamiliar with three-tier architecture. So anyway, in that three-tier architecture, my job is to either interfere with the application stack or interfere with the data abstraction layer, not with the data itself. See, if I can interfere with the application layer, I can do something like... Let's say I come to your page and it has a login and uh, I go ahead and throw in like admin password and it comes back and says, no such username or password. Like, well, shit. But then I type in admin single tick and then I put in whatever I want in password. And instead I get an error that says syntax error. Ding, ding, ding. We have a winner. You're interpreting SQL directly from whatever I give you. So now instead of just a single tick, I can do single tick or tick one equals one. So now your SQL statement says where admin e or where username equals admin or one equals one, which will always be true. Now, if you have an and statement in there, I have a problem. If your statement is, if, if user is this and password is this, now we're, now we're dealing with SQL syntax, right? The and has precedence over the or that I supplied. So it's still going to interpret it as admin and password or one equals one. So I'm still denied, right? But I'm still fucking with the logic. So now I can go down and say admin single tick. And let's say it's a MySQL database. Then I can do hyphen hyphen space. And now what I've effectively done is said, select all from users where user is admin. And I've commented the rest of the line out. So now I get everything. Now you've spit me out the hash that you use for the admin. So now, remember I said earlier, I can take that to Hashcat. So I just throw that to Hashcat. And because I have eight GPUs to work from, I can do billions of passwords in a microsecond. And I've cracked your password before I could even hit enter. Now I have that password and I can go back in. And now I can throw commands because there's a fairly good bet you use the same admin password on your MySQL server. Now I can throw commands directly at. Now not only am I just like looking at your table, I'm altering your data. Or better yet, I'm dumping it all. I'm exporting it, and then I'm deleting it. I'm dropping all your tables. Now I have your data, and you don't. How much is it worth to you? One Bitcoin? Two? You let me know. That's how that works. SQL injection really, is really similar to command injection. The difference is, instead of sending a bash shell command to the, sh to the bash interpreter, I'm sending a command to the interpreting language that sits on top of your database. It could be ASP.NET, it could be PHP, it could be whatever. But what I'm taking advantage of is unsanitized user input. You should have stripped my input. You should have validated my input. You should have never have started letting me throw commands into my input. So that like SQL injection is like, the reason it's so scary is because it's fairly easy but it's only easy if you've worked with a relational database before. You have to understand, like, if you didn't understand the SQL precedence between AND and OR, you're not getting anywhere other than luck. You could brute force it. There's only one out of four possibilities. So probability says you would get it eventually. But if you know what you're doing and you've worked with SQL, it'd be, like, it's, a, it's, it's amazing what you can get a web app to bleed out to you if you know how to use SQL injection appropriately. Yeah. So it's, it's not just a matter of reading. I can change the data. I could update that admin hash, and now I'm admin. Your system's still working. You just can't get into it. Well, let's say you're the sysadmin. You own the database. You get into the command line. You can change it. You can change it at the MySQL level, right? Maybe, unless, unless you were dumb enough to use the same password for your admin on your website as you were for your MySQL database, which, by the way, is like 9 out of 10. 
in which case I went in and changed your actual SQL database too. So now you can't just recover your database. Now what are you going to do? God forbid that I used my SQL's encryption system to encrypt that database using my credentials because now you ain't ever getting it back. Stuff like that. Like it's, it's the initial foothold I need to do a lot of damage is what it really is. Like you still have to be a decent web pen tester. You got to be like, you got to understand web programming. You have to understand how an application will use either an external or its own API as a data abstraction layer to talk to a database. You have to understand how that communication is happening. Is PHP using an ODBC connection to talk to the database? MySQL to uh, PHP, like Apache is using 3306 to talk to MySQL. Is that how it's happening? Or is MySQL presenting a web interface like an API for Apache to talk to? Like all of that comes into account. But that's like, that's, that's why when you get into cybersecurity, I say, pick your poison. There's a lot of paths you can go down. Every one of them is a rabbit hole. You could become a master in any given one of them, but they're all different. And if you're going to work on a team, you will never, there's no one man team. Like we're task, we're, we're task force groups. Like every one of us knows what we need to know. And we know a little bit of everybody else. So we can overlap, assuming that that person can't be there. And fortunately for us, it won't be because of a landmine. It'll be because they're sick for the day. But same principle applies. That's a good point. That's really fascinating. Well, so back to that, cybersecurity has has aligned itself very closely with military. Like we we literally tabletop exercises are from military. We use the same coding. Like, like we took a lot from the military in terms of organizing cybersecurity, and I think that was a great thing to do. I think it makes great analogies, and it makes a great pathway for people like you who are in the military who are technically minded to be able to have a pathway because you already know the language and the lexicon moving in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. So how would you start a cybersecurity business? Depends on what you wanted to do. And of course, like, right. Um, if you want to replicate what you all, no, that's that. Yeah, no, it, let, let me put it to, let me give it to you more like a, here's a pessimistic, a realistic and an optimistic view. That's a good, that's a good views. So the pessimistic view is you grind it out in a couple of subjects that you enjoy. You become a master of those subjects. You look at those subjects and study those subjects through the lens of security. And then you start applying those wherever you can. So if you're starting, this comes down to what any business has the problem of is finding your clients, getting your clients to know you're there. So what I tend to do is if I was going to spin somebody up in the pessimistic mode, I'd have them run through some labs, ideally get a couple of certifications, a security plus, maybe an, uh, an EJPT, something like that. And then I would go around and solicit small and medium sized companies that are local. And I would find the lens in which to make us look useful. So if you go to a place that does credit card business, you know they have to deal with PCI. And if they're a small or medium sized business, you know they've never heard of PCI. So you can offer them a non-qualified, you're not a QSA, but you can offer them a PCI audit and you can go through the motions of doing a PCI audit and generating that report. And now you have experience. Now grind that out. Like learn Sarban Oxley, go do a SOX audit, learn ITGC, go do an ITGC audit, grind that out. If you're going to do pen testing, you're going to have to go talk to people. You're going to have to find people who have a need to worry. And so that, you know, a lot of very small businesses won't care. You know, the local yogurt shop whose Wi-Fi password uh, to their to their Wi-Fi that runs everything is cultured, all lowercase one word. Not saying that's a real example, but they don't care. But the bank up the street that may only have 36 branches in one state across a couple of counties, they don't realize they have the risks they have. And if you can show them they have those risks in a just scary enough manner... You don't want to freak them out, but you want to get them urgent enough that they may want your services. You do those kind of audits. That's that's how I would start. The great thing is, let's say you want to do this and you have absolutely no technical knowledge. You've only ever used your computer for email and writing docs and Facebook. There is a place for you in cybersecurity. So governance, risk, and compliance is a perfect place where you could start with maybe one week of research and maybe an hour course from somebody who's qualified, you could be ready to go out and start acting as an auditor for GRC in any given path. 
You could be third-party vendor risk review. You could do application risk review. You could do SOX audits, PCI audits, ITGC audits. There's all sorts of stuff for you to do. And you don't have to have any technical knowledge. If you have some technical knowledge, you can start looking at blue teaming. It's probably the easiest. So you're looking at like SOC analyst or uh, things of that nature. You're, you're going to be lo- you're going to be working with uh, seams and information systems, things like that. If you again the 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 pessimistic side is the red teamer. The red teamer has to have a lot of technical knowledge. They have to have a lot of hands-on experience, and they have to be confident in what they know and confident in learning what's coming. So, like that, you know, GRC super optimistic. You can get into it with no knowledge. Like start making six figures, no problem. Super pessimistic. You could be a red teamer, you know, web web application pen tester or let's say low level assembler writer. You're writing assembler code so that you can exploit Windows, or you're writing, you know, maybe one step above that. You're writing C so that you can destroy Linux or Windows at the core. Uh, you know, yeah, I can write C. You can't pay me enough to sit down and write a C exploit, but I happen to have a guy who can write assembler in his sleep, and he'll happily write a C exploit. That's his thing. So that, like, that's the other side. If you're going to do any of this stuff, you're going to have to network. You're going to have to meet people. You're going to have to be able to be comfortable with deferring and being able to say that I don't know that, but I have someone who does. On the flip side, you can't be someone who knows nothing. And the only thing, you know, like the, the days of Henry Ford where, oh, I don't know. I have somebody for that. That only gets you so far. You need to be a master of something. And then you can lead a group of masters of other things and create, again, that ideal special forces unit where you have people who are experts in each area and they have overlapping expertise. So basically everybody can cover everything for a contingent. And much like military planning, you have infill, the actual task and exfill all planned and contingents. Cool. Yep. Well, that's been two hours, almost three hours. So dude, Uh, where can people find you? Uh, the only place I am socially is LinkedIn. So uh, find me at LinkedIn slash whatever. I think it's just I N slash C A S E Y A D A V I S. Casey Davis. Cool. And uh, yeah, happy to connect, happy to mentor, happy to answer questions. Really enjoyed this conversation. I look forward to doing something like this again. Yeah, absolutely. I hope everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. Casey Davis, everybody. Goodbye. See ya.